kiellä, lähe saame kiellä, mu vain mu kiellä, mu vain tampi rahallat. I'm glad she's understanding Sami. Hello, my name is Liv Inge Sombi, and uh, I'm so glad and honored that I'm invited to Wikimania and to talk about what we care about, our situation, our children, and how we are delivering information to you. Because this is also about collaboration. As just mentioned, the International Year of Indigenous Languages. This is the year when we can have the shift that we will have more focus about the situation for the indigenous languages. I'm going to talk about that later. I have my topic as the import importance of indigenous languages. And what are the challenges in my area? We are divided into four different countries and we have nine different languages. I'm also going to talk about that. And I'm also going to talk about the responsibility for Wikimania, Wikipedia, Wikimedia. So we will be more visible. Just briefly about me, you can read, so I don't need to say that. But I have been working as journalist for many decades. I was 14 years old when I started first time, because I do care about stories. I was maybe seven, no, I was a little bit older when I wrote letter home that can you please send me money because I'm going to buy a recorder because there are so many interesting stories. At the boarding school where I went to, I wanted to document my life at the boarding school. I work now at Sami University. I call it Sami Allah School. Can we make an agreement that next time when we meet each other, we, you will say it in Sami language, Sami Allah School. This is the university based in Guadagaino, in North Sami region, in North Norway. And I'm teaching there journalism, indigenous journalism, and also Sami language. I'm now member of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in Norway. We are working with the tough issues, the pain, the traumas, and we are now going to collect the stories from the people, their life stories, how they have, uh, how assimilation has affected them, the loss of the language, and also the consequences of Norwegianization. I'm also, because I have been working as a journalist for many decades, I'm also a member of different um, councils at the Norwegian Broadcasting Corporation and NERCO. So, uh, and I grew up on Finnish side. It means that uh, I had to go to a Norwegian school. And I have also worked for almost three years in Russia, Kula Peninsula, Murmansk Oblast or Murmansk region to develop a Sami radio station. In my heart, I was thinking that if we are going to have radio programs in Sami language for the Sami people in Russia, then we can do something that the people are proud of their language and they can get news in their own language. These are our students last year, part of them, the graduation. And also in our Sami Allah School, we have about 270 students from bachelor, master and PhD level. And our students, they are both international students, those who are um, taking courses, master education in indigenous journalism, but we also have uh, quite many of those who are studying language, teacher training, journalism, traditional knowledge, reindeer herding, and also handicraft. Then, about the indigenous perspective. When we are now talking about the International Year of Indigenous Languages, when I'm looking at this picture, I keep thinking that I really want that my Aymara friends from Bolivia, that they're able to read their news in Quechua language. But as you all know, the languages that are chosen are like Spanish. And also, when I'm looking at this picture, I was also thinking about that when we are gathered at Un United Nations, my wish is that we are able to share stories in our own language to our own people. When I'm using social media, I usually prefer to use Sami and English 
because uh, in English I can communicate with the, my friends, those who speak, and Sami then I'm communicating with the Sami people. Indigenous people's perspective. I will already now challenge Wikimania. You have to start to think about how you are going to cooperate together with the indigenous peoples. What about that Wikimania, Wikimedia, Wikipedia, already next year, in April or May, when the, when the indigenous peoples are gathered at, gathered at United Nations Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues, that you will be there and listening that what are the possibilities so you are able to start to, in one way also with a good collaboration. Because at UN Permanent Forum, there are about 2,000 indigenous peoples each year. And there you are able to be connected, have a side event where you are telling how you are working and also to inform the indigenous peoples about what Wikimania is and also what the Wikimedia is and also what Wikipedia is. To earlier this, uh, I saw that 86% of these people in Sweden are using Wikipedia. I must say that, on the other hand, there are quite many few, there are quite few Samis who are using Wikimedia in their own language because we don't have that opportunity yet. Uh, as a reminder to you, when you are going, if you are planning to find tools, how to communicate, how to get in touch, touch with indigenous peoples, the, it's the language revitalization. You have to have in mind, and also that as a goal, that the language shall survive, that the indigenous people are able to read, use internet in their own language. As in Canada, there are more than 60 Aboriginal languages. I don't know how many of these Canadian Wikipedia are using like traditional place names. I don't know, because I'm not expert about that. But um, if there is anyone from Canada or from Australia thinking about why we should also use uh, uh, Aboriginal place names. There are more than 370 million indigenous peoples around the world. They live in 90 different countries. They speak 7,000 languages. And four of 10 are on UNESCO's red list. It means that they will disappear. Then I will ask Wikimania to think that if we want to allow our languages to develop, to strengthen our languages, in what way will you do when you go back to your countries, to your offices, to your institutions? And also when we are thinking about the goals, I was looking at them and I thought that, okay, now when I'm talking about the language, I will also use number four, prefer number four, quality of education. It's not only the education that you have in the classroom or at the university but it's also about the education that you have in your homes, the traditional knowledge, the wisdom of how we are using our language, and also the understanding that how weak we are as indigenous people, that we seldom see anything in our own language or in our own languages. Um, on this picture, you might know Jon Henrik Fjellgren, those who are from Sweden. He is a very famous joiker, singer, and he's singing in South Sami. It means that there are only about 300 people left who speak South Sami. I have a little story, because I think it's important to also tell stories. When I was working in Russia, I was thinking about the situation for the killed in Sami. In Lujauri, Lovosero, in Murmansk Oblast, there are no Sami children learning Sami at school. They have maybe one or two or three lessons because they don't have enough language teachers. And you know, the language situation is quite dramatic now in, in uh, Lujauri or in Russia because people who are older than 45, they speak Kildin Sami or Gelda Sami Gela. Those who are younger, they are not using it. What the youth are doing, they are coming to our university 
to learn the language I'm speaking, North Sami, because North Sami language will give them the opportunities. So I'm reaching out my hand to the people here. How can you do to be engaged thinking about how can indigenous languages survive in Russian side of Sami? and also the indigenous lang languages farther east. Are you able to start to think about, about the project where you are planning that how can we strengthen not only the language, but also that people are able to read in Wikipedia in Kildin Sami about their situation? If you're only writing couple, couple, um, Chapters, it's a good start. Because believe me, my heart is bleeding when I'm thinking about that the children in Russia, in Kola Peninsula, in Lujauri, they are not learning the Sami language, as they have their rights. Because when we're talking about the indigenous rights, it um, requires states to take the responsibility, because we have this United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. It was adopted by the General Assembly at United Nations in 2017, no, 2007. And Article 13 is very clear. Indigenous people have the right to re revitalize, use, develop and transmit, uh, transmit to future generations their histories, languages, oral traditions, philosophies, writing systems and literatures and to designate and retain their own names for communities, places, and persons. This is our right. But do you think the states are following it? No. Some states are working better than others. Some countries are not. Because as I said, indigenous people, they live in more than 90 countries. This is also about the children. I do care about the children because they are our future. Because the indigenous individuals, particularly the children, they have the right to all levels and forms of education of the state without discrimination. I called this morning and asked Swedish television, how many hours do you produce children's TV for Sami children in Sami language? How many hours do you think? Only eight hours. In Norway, NRK, Norwegian Broadcasting Corporation, the Sami division, they are producing 100 hours. So it shows, and in Finland also, it's uh, not that many hours, and in Russia, nothing. So you also, when you go back home, you ask, how many hours are actually the television stations making children's TV uh, in indigenous languages, and also to use it on internet. How many plays and games do we see? Not that many. As I mentioned, and also as it was mentioned, the International Year of Indigenous Languages. I already now do see all the engagement. How people are working in Asia, how they are working in Hawaii, New Zealand, Australia. I'm following the, this hashtag and, uh, and looking what's happening around the world. But I'm also seeing that there are quite many countries that are invisible. Because the language, Giela, it has an important role in our daily lives. It's about how we can communicate, how I can learn, how I can read, how we can play. Can you imagine a Sami child having a Sami language at home, going to internet, trying to find something in Sami language? In Sami languages, it's difficult. So I have chosen these pictures because I'm also showing the possibilities. This is from Svakensichte in the uh, uh, South Sami region in Norway, where they had this huge revitalization project that lasted for many years. And this group of Samis, reindeer herders, they have managed to do something. They are now speaking Sami again. Teaching, learning from the elders and also having this good 
huge, important project run by Professor Jon Todal, who is working at our university. So, there are possibilities. I teach indigenous journalism. And when we are teaching indigenous journalism, then it is about who owns the story. From which perspective are you producing the news or the stories? How are you communicating with the people? In what way? And also, when you are doing the interviews, how are you communicating with this commu uh, the community after, when you leave, when you have had your deadline? We are working with these topics when we are teaching our students. And we are also looking how the mainstream press is covering indigenous stories. And we are doing research. We have many master theses now about how Samis feel when we, foreign journalists are coming to make stories. What is absent? And it's absent how to make the agreements, how to be equal, how to share the pictures, the movies, the stories after when you have done your deadline. This is also about how you are able to communicate. I'm also... thinking about Wikimania, free knowledge and glo global goals. How can you implement indigenous methodologies? How can you think that when you are going to indigenous societies that you get the access? Are you again one of those who are coming to indigenous uh, communities and asking for um, stories, asking for knowledge and then leaving? Or are you also thinking about the equality that you can also, you are also able to teach our society? Because remember, we need, we are not the experts, you are the experts. We need also you to come to our communities so we are able to strengthen the knowledge about us to you and also internal. Are you sharing? the knowledge of how you, when you're work, working in ind indigenous communities, or are you just taking it? Think about that. Because there is a huge skepticism among the indigenous peoples when foreigners are coming and saying that we want to collaborate, we want to do something together, because most of the pro projects are there from their perspective, not us. It's the non-indigenous asking for the knowledge. So. We need information about how we can educate our people and also that we need good partners so we are able to find, like in Wikipedia, in Sami language. And how can you learn from indigenous academy? As I mentioned, permanent forum is the key for you next year maybe not next year, but year after. But think about now when you're going back home again about indigenous languages and also how you are going to cooperate. These two pictures, Inti from Ecuador, he's studying indigenous journalism at Sami Allaskola. He has returned back home again. It was good for us that he came to our university to share his knowledge and we gave our knowledge to him and then we are strengthening also indigenous societies. There are some of you who don't know much about the Sami people. We are one people living in four countries. We live in Norway, Sweden, Finland and Russia. I never say that I'm from Norway. I always say that I'm from the Finnish side of Sami, but I live now on the Norwegian side of Sami, because this is also, it matters about the politics. In Norway, there are about 50,000 Samis. Here in Sweden, 25, between 20 and 25,000. Finland, about 10 to 15,000. And in Russia, 2,500. You see, there are quite huge areas. And we have nine languages. Some of them are in a very difficult situation. There that what is marked red is the South Sami language, and that's 
on UNESCO's red list, and so is, are the blue languages in, uh, in Russia. Ter, Kielta, Achgil. I live in the area where we have the gr which is marked green. And as you see, we don't have borders. We speak North Sami language in Finland, Sweden, and Norway. And also South Sami is spoken in Norwegian side and Swedish side, and so, has, so is Lule Sami. But I cannot communicate with those, I live in the green area, I cannot communicate with those who are living on the blue side or in the red side. Because South Sami is difficult, it's, to, it's um, for me to understand, and also the Gelta Sami Gela. Nine languages. Are you able to make anything in these languages? And how you can do that? That's a challenge for Wikipedia in Norway, Sweden, and also Finland. And also how to implement Russia. What are the challenges being divided into four countries? We have four states. And do you think that these states are communicating that how can we work so we can get a better situation for the Sami people? The land rights, the cultural rights, the language rights. We have Language Act, but how are they strengthening our languages? We have three different Sami parliaments. One in Norwegian side, Swedish side and Finnish side. They work together, but the states, they have their own reforms, school reforms. It means that if they're making a mathematic book in Finland, Finnish side, in Sami language, the children in Norway are not using that because it's not uh, as required uh, uh, fit into a Norwegian school reform or curriculum system. So why don't we start to think about, okay, can we do it this way, that during these days here, and also that you who are here at Wikimania can, can start to think about how you can share information with the Sami parliaments, how you can start to ask for projects. Is there anything that we can do together? Because the Sami parliaments, they do care about the school situation. How come that we don't have history books? How come that we are not making digital uh, uh, platforms where Sami children can learn about Sami history or language uh, at, on the internet? Why is it so difficult? I'm asking these questions because I want you to think. Because believe me, many times I get very sad when I see the situation for our children. Because what they say, the non-indigenous, non-Sami, the state representatives, sometimes they say, that, but you are so few. Yeah, we are few, but there is a reason also. Because this, it, this is also part of colonization. A lot of the Samis, they have lost their languages. These children here, the little boy, he's now about 11 years old. I asked him, how are you choosing? He said, choose what? Are you using anything in Sami on internet? How are you working? How are you developing yourself? He is saying that I'm choosing what I find. I said, okay, what does it mean? I'm choosing what's exciting. It means that children are choosing other languages than Sami. Because there are not enough programs, there are not enough games in Sami language. So our children, they are forced to use the majority languages. These two girls, they are my daughters. When uh, they were little, I gave them the best present, my language. They are fluently Sami speaking. They also fluently sp uh, speak Norwegian, English, and Finnish. But when they grew up, it was that I was translating what we were seeing on uh, television, or, and I was also translating in the beginning what was on internet. Also like Pippi, 
Pippi was in Norwegian, but now Pippi finally can also speak some Sami. Because what these children, they have been complaining about that there isn't enough for us. Digital games, plays, movies, stories, because we are such a good storytellers, but we can't find them. So what they do is that they choose Norwegian, Swedish or Finnish products. I do look forward to see the new school reform or curriculum for next year, how they will implement also digital part in that. Because the state budget in Norway is enormous. It's, they will use 1.7 billion Norwegian kroner for better information and communication technology and digital strategies. But we have to communicate with them what are the SAMI needs. We cannot accept that we are being invisible or only that we are getting some few million. We have to think about what are the language needs and what are the rights of our people. Because the Norwegian Sami parliament, they have their own digital strategy. They want to be the Sami pathfinders in the digital development. The Sami president on Norwegian side of Sami, Aili Keskidalo, she wrote something in a press release which was interesting. She said that we need to be at the digital language level not on a pencil level, because the reality is that we still have Sami teachers who are writing and making books for the children, or even giving this kind of papers to the children that so they're able to learn. But we have some good examples also, like the Arctic University of Norway in Tromsø. They're using a lot of money and they're doing a great job with their language techno projects. Gela Techno, making and developing the digital Sami language. Dictionaries, grammar, language learning, spelling, and even that we have this Sami keyboard that we are using. Ah, sh, f. But what about the other Aboriginal signs and other Aboriginal letters? I see that our children, sometimes when they write, they're very lazy. They are not using sh, they're using s. They're not using the, they're using d. So we see the consequences also of this digital reality. The contrasts are big from country to country. Among the Assamis, we say that if the sack is up, then you have a lot of wisdom in there. In Norwegian side, the last four years, the Sami parliament, they have uh, used 7.1 million Norwegian kroner for digital projects. Translating, but also making new apps. Swedish side, five, 500,000, half a million. And Finnish side, 500,000 euro, which is about 5 million uh, 5 million kroner, but it's also about other products. And Russian side, zero. The aim is Nordic perspective. I would also like to challenge you, because I'm asked to challenge Wikimania. How satisfied are you with the situation for your children, those who are living in Sweden, Norway, and Finland, and other countries? How satisfied are you about what you find in Wikipedia, Wikimedia, about Samis written in your language for your children? It's not much. We do have great stories. We have the traditional knowledge. We have the wisdom that we can also share with non-Sami children. So start to think about also what are your needs, because your children, they do also need to get information about Sami people, learn about Sami society. Believe me, many of the schools, they are teaching almost nothing about the Sami people here in Sweden.
if you go around in Stockholm and ask children, what do you know about the Sami people? They will say, oh, the Sami people, they live in Lavo. Okay, then you will start to t st say that, do you know that they also you, uh, have a um, great language, that they have the digital needs? I'm sure that a minister will also do like that. So, in one way also that the states, together with the Sami parliaments, including you as experts, that we can find the keys how we can start to collaborate. Consequences for children not having the best educational apps. I, I, the other day I did see 50 best apps for the children. I thought, oh, I wish it was something for me. This picture can be, this is my last PowerPoint, this can be the symbolic picture. That this little boy, to be a strong Sami in the future, he has all these helpers behind him. So he will learn, learn how to communicate, learn how to be a strong child in a Sami society. He's also able maybe to move from one country to another. In one way, can you also think about this little boy? It can be the Sami people. And the people who are behind are you who are coming from many, many countries to Wikimania. And then you start to think about the processes, the continuing processes, because we have the wisdom among the Samis that nothing ends, it continues. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Livinger. Uh, before you leave, we, I would like to give you uh, a token of our appreciation. It's uh, Wikimedia Sweden who has donated money in your name to the United Nations Development Program, UNDP. And I think what you're doing is so amazing. I is it okay if I give you a hug? Of course. Oh, of course. amazing. Yeah. Give her a big hand. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. As you might have seen during this morning, we also have with us here today, in, in, uh, here at Stockholm University, two graphical recorders. In Aula Magna, we have Rita, Frida Rit. Uh, maybe you can stand up, just wave. And there, give her a big hand. And they are also... So she is visually recording graphically uh, all the speakers. So we will come back to you during this afternoon session to see how things are going. And I mean, I saw what you had done during the morning. It's pretty amazing. So I really look forward to popping by and see how things are going. Before we go into our next speaker, I would like to check your knowledge about Wikimedia Sweden. Exciting, huh? So if you please could pick up your phones and go into menti.com and enter the code menti.com, that's M-E-N-T-I dot C-O-M, and enter the code 317077, as you can see up on the screen. So my first question is how many percentages of Swedes say that they frequently use Wikimedia. So if we could get the result up again. 317077 is the code at menti.com. So the different possibilities or options are 55%, 85% and 95. It seems like you, you, you think that uh, us Swedes are using it pretty often, 85%. Everyone done? Filled in the results? And 85% is the correct answer. My next question, I mean, since we're talking a lot about the Sustainable Development Goals here today, and there are 17 of them, 
as you have seen during the day and you have the pamphlets on your chairs. Here you can also see them once again. So please enter the number of the sustainable goal that you are working with the most these days, either if it's in work or in your free time. So which one is your, your main one? I know Ulrika, she's going to pit in number five because uh, she works, uh, when she's not moderating, she works quite a lot with gender equality. You're putting in number five, right, on your phone. Yeah, fantastic. Have you guys uh, answered? Is there possible to see some of the answers? Some people still putting in. For our next speaker, this is really, really good insights, right? He's soon to become the chief of staff at Wikimedia, but today he's here as the CEO of Creative Commons. The makers of CC licenses used to share content under simple per, uh, permissive terms to enable use and reuse. So please give a big hand to our next speaker, Ryan Merkley. Thank you very much. I Thank appreciate you. it. Have fun. Oh, this is probably the nicest room I've ever gotten to speak in. This is so beautiful. Uh, Mark and I were just admiring all of the detail up there. It's just such a beautiful space to get to speak in. And I can sort of see your faces if I step a little bit forward. Um, so hello, everybody, and good afternoon. My name is Ryan Merkley. I'm uh, today the CEO of Creative Commons. But as they mentioned in the intro, I am outgoing after five years in this position and the incoming chief of staff at Wikimedia, where I'll start uh, middle of September. Uh, so today I'm wearing my CC hat. This is actually the last time that I'll speak publicly uh, about Creative Commons. So that's kind of uh, bittersweet and a bit of a treat for me because the first time I spoke uh, for Creative Commons publicly was actually at Wikimania 2014. I'd been on the job uh, about six weeks or so uh, and got the chance to speak at the London conference there. Um, and it was a very different event from my perspective as a, as a friend, as a cousin to the movement uh, and CC who have such close relationships. I was remarking to someone in the hall today how, how many organizations and individuals and partners and friends of the movement come to this conference now, and it's uh, really, really heartening to see what we like to call the big open be a place where we all uh, recognize that there's some stuff we're all working on together, um, and that there's a bigger picture that goes beyond just uh, Wikimedia, or just CC, or just Mozilla, or just the Internet Archive, but there are many, many organizations with common goals and a lot of overlap, and so I'm really happy to be part of that and to continue, obviously, being part of that. Um, so let me spend a couple of minutes on what CC licenses are. I know lots of you are fluent in them because they sit as one of the core tools used by the Wikimedia movement, but I'm going to spend just a minute on it. Copyright is automatic. From the minute that you fix the work, which is the minute you create the work, copyright is yours, whether you want it or not. Uh, you don't have to register it. You don't have to do anything. Copyright belongs to you. And that problem of having copyright and not being able to get rid of it easily was the problem that the founders of Creative Commons wanted to solve. They wanted to make it easy for people, the growing enormous group of humans who were making great things and wanted to share them on this new thing at the time, the internet. This was almost 20 years ago. They wanted to make it easy. They wanted to make it so you didn't have to hire a lawyer in order to let other people use your work. And so they came up with this idea that they would hack copyright, that they would build on top of the laws of copyright, which are international and supported by international treaties and also national laws, and that they would make a simple set of licenses that any person could use without paying for them that would work in every jurisdiction eventually. And through the very hard work of international communities and legal experts, those licenses were adapted for every single country in the world. And then combined in the in uh, about eight years ago into the 4.0 license, which was kind of one license to rule them all, a single license that worked worldwide. And the idea was some pretty simple terms that each user who made a work could share. 
under those terms, that you pick your terms, and it's kind of a standard offer. And it takes out that friction of permission. I no longer need to ask you to use your work. You've said you can just use my thing, here are the terms. As long as you follow them, we're fine. And that was meant to increase access to those works. It was meant to create more equitable access to works because you didn't have to know who to ask, you didn't have to have agency or power, all you had to do was read the terms. Um, and it was invent, in, intended to drive greater creativity and more innovation because we don't know where those things come from and the best thing you can do is remove the barriers that enable that to happen so that as people find those works, they can do whatever they may wish to do with them and whatever they need to do with them for whatever their purposes are. So the terms, as many of you already know, buy, which is you may use my work so long as you give attribution, share alike, which means if you make a derivative work, you must license the new work under the same terms. Uh, Non-commercial, which is you can use it for whatever you like as long as your primary purpose is not a commercial use or a for-profit use. And no derivatives. You may use my work, but you can't make anything new out of it. You must use it as I've given it to you. So I'm here to talk a little, about, a little bit about CC and our impact and our relationship to the SDGs. And you know us for the licenses. Those licenses have been applied to over 1.6 billion licensed works around the world um, in just about everything you could possibly copyright, from the obvious things like photos and video to the newer things like 3D models. Um, and people are sharing those things all over the world. One of the areas we do the most of our work in probably intersects with SDG 4 down here, the education SDG. Um, and for us, um, we really think that the CC licenses put uh, this sort of infrastructure of open into open education. Now, open education is this idea that these tools that we, uh, or these resources that we want, can be used by anyone in any way they want. Sounds a lot like Wikipedia, but in addition to that, that those, the as we take open education forward, it goes beyond just the idea of open educational resources, reusable tools, licensed that anyone can remix and reuse and adapt, but actually to the idea of a meaningful engagement with the learner. The idea that the learner can have those materials adapted for them and so that they can reflect them. And so you'll see the names of people who sound like your name in the materials that you're learning from or that your stories can be adapted into the learning materials that are being given to you. Or even better, that you can be co-author of those materials as a student, as part of your work. Uh, and those who know the Wiki Education Foundation know that that's core to basically how they work. This idea of having people contribute to something that has value in the world and learning while they're doing it. And all the research says that when you give people those kinds of experiences, they learn better. So we've, we've figured out how to learn better. We've figured out how to teach people better and meet them where we are. We've also, through open education, worked on issues of inclusion and equity because those materials are accessible to everyone. In Michael's talk this morning, one of the things he talked about was how 100 and change, $100 million to one project, in some ways would seem like a drop in the bucket. And for those of us who work in open education, where philanthropy has done so much amazing work to seed the world of open education, we also know that it's kind of a drop in the bucket when you compare it to what governments spend every single day on education around the world. It's trillions and trillions of dollars. And so the real money is if you can get governments to get together and see the value of open education and the potential of collaborating internationally, where the one thing that you build gets reused and reused and reused. This sounds obvious to those of us who've worked in open source and open content for so long, where the first rule of open source is never write new code. Look at what's already been built and see if there's something that already serves your challenge. See if there's a way that you can remix it and reuse it. See if there's a community already trying to do it. Why don't we do that in education? Think how farther and faster we could go, excuse me, we could go with SDG4 if everything that anyone built became primary material for the next thing everyone else built. Now, one of the things Creative Commons does as part of our work is advocacy all over the world. And most recently, earlier in the summer, I was in Paris at UNESCO, um, where a number of organizations, including Creative Commons, but lots of other players who we work with in the movement, and countries, representative countries from all over the world, spent two days in a room editing and working on a recommendation from UNESCO which would endorse the concepts of open education and start to embed them in the work of international governments, to start to get at those trillions and trillions of dollars. 
Now, a recommendation from UNESCO is about as high as you can go in international before you get to something like the SDGs. So it's a pretty big deal. And this November, that recommendation will actually go to UNESCO and will be hopefully approved by all of the member states. We're pretty excited about that work. I think there's a real opportunity for advocates and governments and educators everywhere to grab onto that because these things, as you've already seen with the SDGs, stand as an example that people can ha point to and say, no, this is, this is where we want to go. This is the direction that we hope to seek, and we're going to go there together. And I think there's, there's a lot of power there um, and a lot of potential uh, when that gets approved, hopefully in November. So before I run out of time, one thing I just wanted to uh, float, because in Michael's comment this morning, one of the things he said, and I really liked, was he talked about the value of play. Um, and the importance of throwing out new ideas and seeing if they stick. And so I want to share with you an idea that comes from a colleague of mine. His name's Cable Green, and he's the director of open education at CC and well known in the open education community. And Cable, for a number of years, has been talking about this idea that I really have kind of started to fall in love with, and maybe more so because this is the perfect place to talk about it, is the idea of an SDG degree. The idea that we would reframe the SDGs, the most challenging issues facing our society, and build education systems around them, where every student at appropriate levels for where they are would have curriculum that was designed to invite them into the problems and also to work on how they would tackle them. And we would do it in an open educational context. So everything that they made would be shared openly. They'd be able to start their work once they were introduced to the issue, looking at other work that had come before so that they can continue to iterate and remix and rebuild and come up with new ideas. You could even have actual university degrees, but instead of a degree in, say, the arts, you might have a degree in life on land or life below water built around tackling those challenges and addressing those issues in a way that would help us move that ball forward with everything published openly, all of the papers open access, all the materials open educational resources, and everything designed not just for use, but for remix. Because until we start remixing those problems and realize that innovation could come from anywhere and everywhere, we'll never really tackle these challenges together in the ways that meet every single community where they are. I really want to thank the organizers for this, this theme. Um, it's exciting to be able to kind of take the work that we do every day and mash it up against a very different idea that so obviously intersects but is not a place that I think we normally would have gotten to by ourselves. Uh, and so I find that really exciting and I appreciate the opportunity to kind of think a little bit differently about the work that we do. Last thought, you know, the, the thing that really lights me up is collaboration. I get excited about the kinds of work that can only be done when people work together. The things that we can only do when it's all of us, not just one of us. Um, and the thing that we've all decided to do and build together is one of the greatest, greatest collaborations in human history. And it has the potential to work on every single one of these goals and beyond. And so that's really, really exciting for me. I look forward to working with all of you in the future in my new capacity. And I want to thank everybody for all the opportunities that I've had to work with you in my previous role uh, at CC. Thanks very much and enjoy the conference. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you. Also, lovely. you get this. Uh appreciation that this is very thoughtful thank yeah you. thank you Appreciate thank you very it. much thank you thank you it was a lovely speech um, you started with this building and then uh, also the thing you said about the free education in the global goals very lovely thought so thank you and the next we are moving from the radical free uh, open sources and into a more world of university and formal education. Uh, the next speaker, she will talk about uh, open science and education for, uh, and how important this is for the sustainable life. And the solution for this, as Ryan also said, is collaboration and communications. And especially in this area, you work with the agriculture sector. And so our next speaker is not only a professor in physical geography, she is also deputy vice chancellor at the Swedish University of Agriculture Sciences. Let us make her feel welcome. Karin Holmgren, welcome Thank to you. the stage. Thank you, Ulrika. Hello and good afternoon, everyone in the hall and those of you who might sit somewhere else in the world listening to this. 
Societies around the world are facing social, economic and environmental challenges so complex that we need completely new approaches to meet them. No individual can tackle these challenges alone. We must act together to find solutions. In the globalized world of today and tomorrow, we must depend on each other. Development that is sustainable for all people, animals and plants on our planet requires a transition from a fossil-based society and a linear economy to a bio-based society with a circular economy. We have to meet the Paris Agreement and reduce our greenhouse gas emissions to stop global temperatures from rising. We have to meet the United Nations 17 and indivisible goals, sustainable development goals, to transform our world to one with more sustainable development. Human-induced changes to the climate and environment and the growing global population place huge demands on how we manage our land and water. The strain on our green and blue natural resources is bigger than ever before. Climate change will have direct physical effects, for example, due to increased or decreased rainfall, stronger weather extremes and rising sea levels. Measures to mitigate the effects include the appropriation of land for new uses, beneficial for some, but likely to be, uh, inc increase the vulnerability of others. The production of biofuels competes with the production of food and may affect the resilience of valuable ecosystems. The need to both produce and preserve is not an equation that is easily solved. We know fairly well what we have to do to contribute to sustainable development, but the road is still not an easy one. The choices we have to make are many and often difficult. The drivers of change are multiple and interlinked, and the effects on social and ecological and cultural systems are complex and often unexpected. Change is not inherently good or bad. Instead, it has to be negotiated in relation to different social needs where the ecological sustainability also has to be accounted for. There will be conflicts between different objectives and trade-offs will be necessary. These complex issues, so-called wicked problems, are increasingly emerging as the threat of global warming, and they call for rapid action as the amount of land claimed for the production of energy, food and other goods are increasing. I represent the Swedish University of Agriculture Sciences, SLU. Our research and teaching are centered around our biological resources on land and in water and how we can use them in a sustainable manner. That means that all the SDGs are at our core. We need to develop sustainable and bio-based products to replace those based on coal and oil. Forest and agriculture land, pastures and natural land, parks and peri-urban environments, lakes and seas, they all need to deliver sustainably produced food and other goods. We need to develop production systems and create technological solutions to bind carbon. And we need to preserve biodiversity and cultural diversity. Thank you to leave to remember us about that. And uh, promote the development of healthy cities and rural areas for people, animals and plants. Science-based knowledge, analytical skills, a critical approach and an open creative mind are needed to turn future challenges into opportunities. The importance of sharing knowledge in order to meet the SDGs cannot be underestimated, as also so well expressed by Ryan. I also believe that it is important that universities are where people come looking for knowledge on social media, Wikimedia, and so on. The issue of open science has been discussed a lot lately. It is a broad term that includes open access to scientific publications and research data. If research findings 
uh, are published more openly, they will of course become more useful to society. Let me give you some concrete examples of the value of sharing knowledge. Compared to other Swedish universities, SLU has a unique assignment to conduct environmental monitoring and assessment of our green and blue ecosystems, and to publish this as open data. This data makes up-to-date knowledge on issues related to sustainable development available to decision makers and the general public. These activities also include environmental monitoring based on volunteering, so-called citizen science. One of our flagship is the Species Observation System. It is an open system for searching and recording sightings of plants and animals. Once a sighting is recorded by a user, it becomes fully available and visible to all other users. The intention behind this is to stimulate interest in biodiversity among the general public and to increase public understanding on conservation measures. But at the same time, it is making efforts relating to sustainable management of our biological resources much more efficient. To date, this system contains over 50 million species observations and has received over 20,000 reported observations in a single day. These are impressive numbers, and they mean that the material, together with comprehensive environmental monitoring and, as and assessment, is a good use for scientifically sound statistical analysis, an important source of information for decision support on, on necessary conservation measures, and a true service to the general public that allows it to both participate in providing knowledge as well as gain knowledge and advice on how we should be using natural resources to create the least negative environmental impact. Another example uh, comes to education, and, I would, and I'm going to talk about the so-called MOOCs, Massive Online Open Courses. So-called MOOCs are free online courses available to everyone. More and more universities are offering them. My university was a slow starter in this respect. When I was first introduced to this concept a couple of years ago, I didn't see the point. Those types of courses wouldn't give us any proceeds, no income. But now, as I have followed the initial results of our first book, which is entitled Effective Livestock produ Production with Low Use of Antibiotics, I realize what an amazing concept it is. A digital, openly available university course is an excellent way of spreading scientifically based knowledge and contributing to lifelong learning. What I especially appreciate about our MOOC is that it focuses on antibiotic issues connected to low-income countries, places where veterinarians and animal owners often cannot pay for courses and continuing professional development. And in regard to SLU, a MOOC naturally contributes to broadening the knowledge of our university. Third example, uh, refers to international research networks. Agriculture plays a vital role in food security, poverty reduction and sustainable development. The agriculture sector is particularly vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. It faces significant challenges in meeting a dramatic increase in global food demand, while also meeting the need to reduce its contribution to greenhouse gas emissions, as was highlighted in the IPCC latest report released just a few days ago. Global research networks are important for developing and sharing knowledge, and SLU is engaged in many such initiatives. I will here just mention one, the Agriculture for Food Security, is a research network that aims for sustainable intensification of agriculture for increased food production on existing agricultural land. In the program, researchers from target countries and Sweden collaborate and build capacity to synthesize and co-create scientific data and research findings in dialogue with stakeholders. My final example is about an international partnership initiated by my former employer, Stockholm University, here, and which I was deeply involved in for many years. 
This partnership called Navarino Environmental Observatory is a partnership between Stockholm University, the Academy of Athens and the private sector uh, through the company Temes, equal tourist company Temes in Messenia in Greece. The mission of NEO is to be a source of inspiration, a leader in groundbreaking research and education, and a point of reference for policy, strategy, and management on the climate and environment in the Mediterranean region. NEO has become an international hub for frontline research and education across disciplines and a forum for science policy practice, dialogue, and exchange of experiences, ideas, and knowledge by engaging stakeholders. I have now mentioned a few examples of how, with a strategy for openness, the academic community, the private sector, and civil society can work together to encourage sustainability and solutions to environmental challenges, and those promote the transition to a low-carbon economy. Building capacity and sharing knowledge between countries and organizations is an important way of strengthening international links and increasing cooperation and collaboration. Transformation towards more open science, open data, and open education is needed to support this. To succeed, there are obstacles to overcome. According to the Open Access 2020 Global Initiative to propel open access forward, most of the world's academic output is still locked behind paywalls, hindering the full impacts of research findings. One obstacle is the current academic merit system, which often is based on a journal's prestige, which so far does not include open access journals. And collaboration with society is still not highly merited in many academic systems. These obstacles must be overcome and can be overcome. We live in a time where knowledge is produced, transmitted, and acquired in different ways from before. The world is increasingly digitalized. This means new challenges for universities when it comes to the content, design, and communication of our research and our educational programs. In addition to the necessary theoretical and practical subject knowledge, it is also about researching and teaching transdisciplinarity, and not least about enhancing our students' ability to think critically, be creative, and handle complex issues. As the Swedish researcher Lars Densik so well expressed it, building and knowledge are needed to be able to nuance, to be able to reflect, and based on that, maneuver into new territories. To live with ambivalence, to harbor opposite perspectives, to confront complexities, to see things from one side and from the other to find arguments both for and against. Science-based knowledge, analytical skills, and open creative mind are also needed to understand and respond to worrisome issues in the world, such as radical political course changes and the growth of populism, the increasing number of terrorist attacks in the world, the sometimes problematic tone of conversation and the spreading of alternative facts on social media. The universities can contribute to breaking these trends by participating in discussions and dialogue in open media, be where people are, and highlight the importance of science-based knowledge and proven experience. However, we also need to convey acceptance and respect for the fact that there are not always absolute facts to help us make easy choices. Nevertheless, by stronger participation by scientists in open media, we can hopefully bridge barriers between academia and society, strengthen our, abil our ability to discuss, evaluate, and understand complex issues based on both knowledge and basic democratic values, such as objectivity, factuality, equal treatment, freedom of opinion, and respect. Instead of being hindered by various perceived barriers, we should take advantage of and use the diverse expertise we have from within the academia as well as between academia, stakeholders and the general public to explore how we together can generate new knowledge. 
transdisciplinary research, open discussions and dialogues are needed to advance our understanding of the complex causes behind ecological and social dynamics. Such an understanding can provide vital links in the chain that can build sustainable development at local, regional and global levels. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we would also like to hand over our appreciation, a donation made in your name to the UNDP. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm a little bit curious what's happening on the graphical recording. So Frida, how are things going over there? Oh, this is uh, Karin's... Uh, looks pretty awesome, right? Very impressive. I know that you're not done, but thank you for giving us uh, a preview or sneak peek. Since 1631, we have had national registrations of addresses in Sweden. First, it was done by the church and now the state. And before that, it was even done by tax length. It's quite hard for me sometimes to understand that there are a lot of people in the world who doesn't have an address. Understand how they are affected when there are big disasters. Therefore, geomapping has become more and more important. And one NGO or non-governmental organization that works with geomapping is Humanitarian Open Street Maps Team, also called HOT, or H-O-T, HOT. And our next speaker, I'm so excited to have the executive director of HOT with us here today. Let's give him a big hand, Tyler Radford. Thank you. Great. Good afternoon, everyone. It's great to be here today. One of the favorite things uh, when I was thinking about my talk today, one of the favorite things about working in a global open community um, like Wikipedia or OpenStreetMap is that wherever you go throughout the world, you always run into old friends. And sometimes uh, those old friends are people who you only know by their username or only know online. Um, but you meet, and you meet people who are doing amazing work throughout the world. And so today I want to tell you uh, three stories from some of our community members around the world. Last year I traveled to Tanzania and I met Sada. So Sada is a university student in her second year at RD University and she was working in an industrial training program with us. Um, and she was working to survey or map her city of Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. Uh, when Sada offered to take me out on a little mapping tour of the city, one of the things that most impressed me is that she, a, a student in only her second year of university, was confidently ordering around a group of male students several years older than her. Um, when I talked to her about what she was doing, she told me that just a few years earlier, her family home was actually flooded up to the roof and that she was displaced out of her home for three days. And during that time, she wasn't able to attend school uh, she also lost most of her books in, in that flooding. But Sada wasn't content with being simply a disaster survivor. She was taking an active role in building resilience in her community, uh, mapping every individual kilometer of road and every meter of the drainage system in Dar es Salaam. Also in Tanzania, I met uh, two other women. On the left there, you'll see Roby and on the right, you'll see Janet. So Roby is a survivor of female genital mutilation, or FGM. This is a process by which a child's genitalia are altered or injured at a very young age um, in Tanzania. Roby, not content with merely being a survivor of FGM, was taking an active role 
in changing this uh, pattern for hundreds of other young girls in Tanzania, mapping the location of remote villages throughout her country in order to locate and rescue girls from the practice. In Uganda, I visited, and that's me on the right there. You can see the sort of the, the back of me walking along. Um, this is in Bidi Bidi. So Bidi Bidi is the second largest refugee settlement in the world. There I met Michael Yanni. Michael's a South Sudanese refugee. And Michael, not content with merely surviving the war in South Sudan, was waking up every day, getting on the back of a motorcycle with his driver, in going out and collecting map data um, throughout areas that hosted nearly one million South Sudanese refugees. I wanted to let Michael uh, introduce himself. Hello, uh, Mike Oyani. I'm a South Sudanese uh, refugee. I'm hosted in the Rhino Camp refugee settlements of Wazan. Yeah. Hello, I'm Diane Amando Ogunu. I come from Omogo, Arua, Uganda. Together, we yeah. work with Hot, Hot Uganda. Uganda. Now, to the SDGs. You heard this morning about uh, the 17 global goals. I think Michael also mentioned the 169 targets. There are also 232 indicators. And these indicators are uh, how we measure our progress towards achieving the goals. There's a big problem here, though. Nobody has this data. No one individual or organization has this information. The SDGs also call for leaving no one behind. But Sada, Roby, and Michael are all working in places around the world where people are still not being counted. Going back to BDBD, you see it here on the map. This is an area, as I mentioned before, um, the population of England's second largest city, Birmingham, and twice the land area of Paris. This is how it appears on, on most maps, a single point. We believe that there are thousands of such locations throughout the world, up to one billion people living in areas that don't appear on any publicly available map source. If everyone counts, if we're to leave no one behind, then we need to know where people live. We need to know the location of every home, every school, every hospital. Going back to northern Uganda, I wanted to show you a few maps of how our community works to, to make a difference here. As you see each dot on the map light up, this represents one individual facility. Some of these are health facilities or clinics. Some of these are schools. These are being added to the map by community mappers working either remotely or on the ground in Uganda, uh, filling in what looks to be a blank canvas. And again, you can see the process. This is a time-lapse video, uh, late 2017 into early 2018, about how the process works for roads. Thousands of edits are being made by mappers around the world and on the ground in Uganda as they traverse each kilometer of road, each footpath, each trail, and make that data publicly available via OpenStreetMap. We also now have artificial intelligence and machine learning to make this process happen faster. So you can see here an experimental uh, editor, map editor from Facebook, which automatically detects road segments from satellite imagery and helps our mappers uh, to work better and, and faster and smarter and produce higher quality data. But you simply can't see it all from the sky. We do need uh, local knowledge and contributions from the ground. Here you see my colleague Joffrey working in northern Uganda. He's out surveying a, a water point. If we want to know the name of this street in the local language, if we want to know what's sold in this shop, this is the person that we need to be asking. This is the person that needs to be contributing. And if we want to live in a world in which every single human being can freely share in the sum of all knowledge, then we need to create a world in which every person is free to easily and seamlessly contribute that knowledge. Uh, to date, we've had one million contributors to OpenStreetMap. 200,000 of those contributors were working for causes specific to the SDGs or the global goals. But it's, it's quite simply, it's not enough. 
we have what I'm going to call a matching problem. So with the proliferation of the sharing economy, we have apps like Uber and Airbnb to match up supply and demand. But open knowledge is a little bit different. We don't have an Uber for open knowledge or local knowledge. Um, the, when we look back to the Wikipedia vision, this is one in which every human being can freely share in the sum of the world's knowledge. The humanitarian open street map vision is one where every person is counted, that the knowledge that they share and produce is, actually gets used in decision making that can save and improve lives. And that every person has a right to be able to engage and actually contribute their knowledge to the map. We build the best map of the world when that map, represent, map represents the collective knowledge of the world. If every place must be mapped, every person should have an opportunity to take part in that process. So I'll show you one example. This is SDG target 11.5, which focuses on reducing the number of deaths and number of people affected by disasters. Uh, local contributions play a key part to actually achieving these SDGs, and I want to make it very clear why What's the link between data and information in contributing the goals? Here it is. Uh, these are some of our university students who are working to walk house by house, building by building, standing sometimes ankle deep in water, to record places that are prone to flooding historically. When you combine thousands of these contributions together, you're able to see um, maps that look something like this. So this is. As you see it swipe uh, from right to left there, this is the before and after. An area that's seemingly, uh, seemingly blank is a place that actually has thousands of buildings in it. Um, and through this process of adding those buildings to the map and then walking the ground to color in the local detail of which buildings may have experienced flooding, we get to know more about a place, more about a location, and can then start to actually make decisions that um, that can reduce uh, the impact of disasters or other crises. I've talked a lot about the data that gets produced, but it's not only about the data. Contributing local knowledge to a project like OpenStreetMap or to Wikipedia um, or any of the Wikimedia projects, this really empowers young people to play active roles in their communities, so developing awareness and advocacy. The, con the community contributed data can certainly help to monitor some of the SDG indicators and, and gauge our progress towards some of the targets. But most importantly, the process by which it's collected, um, as contributors become more aware of the world around them, uh, helps them to d develop also critical technology skills and, and skills that will benefit them beyond the, the immediate period of contributing to the project. So back to northern Uganda again, to BDBD. If you remember back to, to Michael's introduction, um, his, Michael and his team collected more than 2,400 water points. So these are all the individual wells and boreholes, sources of drinking water uh, throughout the refugee settlements. The ones indicated in red are not functional. So these are places where um, so the well has dried up or there's no drinking water um, accessible on a, on a regular basis. The, by, by adding these points to the map, um, refugees are very directly making their voices not only visible but heard by the international humanitarian community um, to respond and take action to. And this enables taking action on targets like 6.1 universal and equitable access to safe and affordable drinking water for all. So I also would like to share a few ways on how I see the OpenStreetMap community and the Wikimedia community coming together to tackle some of these big issues and some of these big challenges. One of the things we're working on right now is a guide um, called Open Mapping for the SDGs. And this talks about how open data, especially geospatial data, can play a role in contributing to SDGs. And it also gives you a sense of how to do this locally in your own country. I would love for the Wikimedia community, um, and I would love to talk to you all about this during the weekend, um, to think about how we can do something similar uh, for Wikimedia, how, each, uh, how some of the projects contribute directly to the goals, and maybe even uh, write a combined guide together or think about sharing uh, information together. 
I'm talking about linking the two projects. So we know that Wikidata, Wikidata and OpenStreetMap are much stronger together. Um, just to give you a few examples of that, so the, the animation you're seeing is um, in OpenStreetMap's ID editor. You can now add, and I think we're looking at a, um, a public, maybe a, it's a fountain or something like that. You can now add Wikidata tags um, within OpenStreetMap. Um, and so those will link uh, the, two, the two data sources together. One of the other OpenStreetMap projects is we're working on building a common list of brand names of things like uh, stores, pharmacies, et cetera, so that when you add those types of establishments to the map in OpenStreetMap, um, we, we can then link out to um, the Wikipedia article that, that references that. Um, we know that place is very important to both projects. And there's also a, a session happening later today, which I'm look, really looking forward to, about a new tool you can access at osm.wikidata.link to help find matches that exist in both projects and, and link those up together. So I mentioned before, 17 global goals, 169 targets, 232 indicators. I think the most important thing that I thought that I want to leave us with today is um, it's not a technical one. It's not a, it's not a data recommendation. It's about how our two communities might be able to work together, um, and especially towards the goal of helping every person in every country to be able to contribute to the projects, breaking down barriers and helping to build communities where they don't exist. So I'd love to speak with each of you around how we might be able to do that um, in the countries that we're working. And finally, if you remember Sada from Tanzania, I'd like to maybe finish up by just showing you a little video of what she's been up to. Thanks to Chris Morgan and Fundi Films for opening this up under Creative Commons license to share today. Appreciate it. Thank you. I, I have to give you a hug as yeah. well. I think, I mean, wow, what an amazing work you are doing here. Thank you it's, very much. Uh, it's uh, really touching my heart. And as a tiny appreciation, but from Wikimania Sweden, we would like to hand over a donation that's made in your name to the UNDP. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for coming here. Thank, Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Tyler. Tyler, sorry. Um, yes. When, didn't you moderate something else before? Yes. So 
When I moderated TEDx last year, one of the speakers was Greta Thunberg. She is a 16-year-old girl who went on a school strike to save the climate. She managed to inspire others and has now created a global movement all around the world. Another global movement that was founded by two people, Larry Sanger and Jimmy Wales, with today more than 50 million articles written. Do you know which movement that is? Wikimedia. <laughs> yeah, Wikimedia, totally right. And it's the largest encyclopedia ever. And it's really, really amazing what, what you all have done. Yes. Yeah. And one of the questions we raised this morning was that can Wikipedia movement contribute to a better world? And one thing that really strikes me, Jenny, is if you look here and also in the morning with all the diversity, all the knowledge in the room, all the experience uh, that you have from different countries, from different uh, areas of uh, knowledge. And if you look around and see every person as a source, as a treasure for new knowledge, we want to, um, so that you can really achieve the Wikimedia vision. Imagine a world in which every single human being can freely share in the sum of all knowledge. Isn't that amazing? So therefore, we would like to encourage everyone here in the room to, during the break, connect with someone new. Take the opportunity to talk to a new person over the coffee, or as we call it in Sweden, fika, fika, uh, and share your thoughts on today's sessions. Share your knowledge, what you're doing, and come up with ideas on maybe how you can improve the movement even more. And how you can do it thinking about or having the, keeping the sustainable goals in, in your thoughts. So the fika will be served on the two floors, so you can exit there or at the top. And fika is coffee and pastries. Exactly. And we welcome you back at 3.15 or 15.15 in this room. So welcome back at 15.15. Thank you. Thank you.
Men Frida är inte här. Jo, hon är visst där. Ja, ah, bra. So, welcome back from the fika. I hope you enjoyed the fika and also find some friends, discuss what you have been learning or ideas you have. Um, we want to share also, Frida, how is it going with the graphic facilitation? Can we see a picture? Maybe we are a little curious. <gasps> Look, there are yes. several. Yes, so these are for the four sessions. Yeah, let's give her yes. a big hand. And this will be fine afterwards if you're interested. And you also can take a picture of the one from the, from the morning part. So It's so thank cool. You. you can even see her doing the drawings uh, now. It's very nice. Yeah. And help you to so remember. So it's time to continue our sharing. So the two main focuses today has been free knowledge and the sustainable goals. So how is Wikimedia working and collaborating together with the United Nations? Our next speaker is Wikimedian in residence for UNESCO. And UNESCO is a United Nations organization working to build peace in the minds of women and men. Please give a big hand to our next speaker, John Cummings. Yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> It fell down. <laughs> yeah, so this is a party <laughs> trick that we uh, usually do after Fika, just to make sure that everyone is awake. Okay. Are you all good? Hands up. Fantastic. Yeah. Are you good to go? Yeah. Fantastic. Okay. Let's high five. Good. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so I've been at UNESCO, which is the UN Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization, for about four years now as Wikimedia in Residence. I work with several UN agencies to help them share their knowledge on Wikimedia projects. I want to ask what Wikimedia's relationship to the Sustainable Development Goals could be in the future. Please keep in mind the very clear time limits to many of the SDGs. The world has less than 12 years to halve our carbon emissions, and that humans are causing species extinction at least a thousand times faster than the natural rate. The Sustainable Development Goals provide a framework for changing the world, and Wikipedia is one of the main places people are going to for the information they want to make that change. 500 million people read 20 billion Wikipedia articles every month. Wikipedia is available in over 300 languages. To put this into context, Facebook is only available in 100 languages. In 2016, the Wikimedia Foundation asked people what Wikipedia meant to them. This response helps me think about Wikimedia's role in the goals. Wikipedia is why, even though I spent most of my adult life out of school as a refugee, when I finally got to a safe place and into a university, I was able not only to compete with my peers, but to excel. Wikipedia's impact on the Sustainable Development Goals is hard to measure, but it's happening. People often talk about large social media platforms having responsibilities. Given Wikipedia's audience and the context of the SDGs, what responsibilities does Wikimedia have? Does it have a responsibility to provide content that will help us reach the Sustainable Development Goals? I think it does. If we accept Wikimedia ha is playing a part in the goals and has a responsibility to provide information, what could the future look like? I find this quote really helpful in thinking about the relationship between the goals and Wikimedia. Where your talents lie and the needs of the world meet is where you find your true purpose. Achieving the SDGs needs action from governments, NGOs, community groups, companies, and individuals. The, important, the information needed to reach the SDGs is currently spread over thousands of websites. It's an extremely hard to find, given Wikimedia's reach, and it has a unique role to play in the goals. I think that Wikimedia could become the central knowledge repository for the information we need to reach the Sustainable Development Goals. In fact, I think Wikimedia are the only ones who could do it.
Wikimedia's strategic direction states, by 2030, Wikimedia will become the essential knowledge infrastructure of the ecosystem of free knowledge, and anyone who shares our vision will be able to join us. At this point, I want to remind you we have less than 12 years to halve our carbon emissions to prevent catastrophic climate breakdown. I think Wikimedia needs to get really serious about working with other organizations to achieve the goals. Wikimedia has the audience and the infrastructure, but most of the uh, information is held by other organizations. As an example, this uh, image comes from the Hubble Space Telescope, which make all their images available for free, which is great because the Hubble costs $10 billion. We have to work with other people to get all the content we need. What if this same level of quality and like professional uh, content could be made available across all of Wikimedia? Not just images, but also text, data, and 3D models. Who do we need to work with to make this happen? So who holds the knowledge to reach the SDGs? Every organization has unique knowledge to share with the world, but if we want to prioritize content related to the SDGs, a really good place to start is looking by who is already working with them. Partnerships can do more than improve Wikimedia content. They understand Wikimedia from other perspectives and can help Wikimedia understand itself better. This is the African humanist philosophy, uh, philosophy of Ubuntu. That person is a person through other people. Uh, this is the original drawing for the UN, uh, uh, drawn by Franklin Roosevelt. Uh, so let's use the UN as an example of a set of partners to explore what might be possible to achieve uh, in the next, in the future. Wikimedia is already working with several UN agencies. Uh, I'm working at UNESCO. Wikimedia Argentina and Wikimedia Foundation are working with OHCHR on human rights. May Hashem is working with UN Women on gender. And Sherry Antoine is working with uh, UN Secretariat on, di and on diversity and inclusion. The UN holds much of the knowledge people need to reach the sustainable development goals. Uh, but currently, it's very hard to find this information. The World Bank, which is part of the UN, did a study that showed a third of their reports had never been read and only 13% have been read more than 250 times. Let's look at one specific UN agency, UNESCO, where I've been working for the past four years. Like many other UN agencies, UNESCO performs many roles. It collects knowledge from across the world. When you hear a statistic like 260 million children out of school, UNESCO are the ones who collected that information. It's a convener of people. It has thousands of partnerships built up over 70 years with governments, NGOs, universities, and other UN agencies. It educates millions of people around the world on the sustainable development goals, including through its very large social media channels. UNESCO's work on the collection and creation of knowledge is mainly done through producing hundreds of books every year. These publications are extremely high quality and written in accessible ways by experts, but currently, experts spent, but currently asking these experts to uh, write Wikipedia articles just isn't, isn't a viable option. They don't have the time. Fortunately, UNESCO publishes under a Wikipedia-compatible open license, so we developed a simple process to add the text from these publications into Wikipedia. We now have over 250 articles using text from UNESCO that are viewed over 4.8 uh, million times per month. UNESCO also has over 100,000 photos in their archives, stretching back over 70 years. The, they document the history of the work of UNESCO, but also by extension, they document the history of the world. UNESCO has recently started uh, to agree to upload the content, uh, and they're doing that in partnership with our hosts, Wikimedia Sweden. So they're going to play a role in educating people through, uh, around the world through Wikipedia. So one project that brings UNESCO and Wikimedia's expertise together is finding GLAMS. So Wikimedia Sweden and UNESCO are working together, funded by the Swedish Postcode Lottery. 
to build the first worldwide database of cultural heritage institutions. Having this information in one place is extremely important for education, but also for protecting cultural heritage. As an example, after the earthquake in Nepal in 2015, many of the cultural heritage institutions, uh, their collections survived the earthquake, but were destroyed because people didn't know where the, the museums and libraries were, so they couldn't protect them from the rains. This isn't just a problem for the Global South. Research from the Council on Library and Information Resources found 98% of the archives in the US were at risk from climate change this century. So this is what our database currently looks like. As you can see, much of Europe, North America, and Japan are very well documented, but basically the rest of the world is invisible. That's because the data is missing. By partnering with UNESCO, it's much easier to work with cultural organizations, governments, and the public to collect the information we need and make it accessible in Wikimedia in over 300 languages. For Wikimedia to become the central knowledge repository for the SDGs, what can we do now? If you work for an organization and want to share your knowledge on Wikipedia, the answer is fairly simple. Contact your local Wikimedia chapter or user group, and they'll help you guide, guide you through the process. For Wikimedia contributors, I'd like to offer two suggestions. Firstly, there's a concept called testimonial injustice developed by Miranda Fricker, where someone's knowledge is ignored because they belong to a specific social group. Wikimedia is based on what we call reliable sources, However, when people's knowledge is ignored by these sources, and when we use it on Wikipedia, this perpetuates the injustice and creates an invisible hole in Wikipedia. I think we need to fix this urgently. When we connect knowledge from different parts of the world, it doesn't just flow from the global north to the global south. It flows in both ways. Introducing everyone to new ideas and new knowledge. Enriching our experiences and makes, it makes us more capable of solving problems, including the SDGs. Secondly, I find it really helpful to think about the concept of congruence, which means acting in line with your values. Your knowledge of how Wikimedia works is extremely valuable. You can both improve Wikipedia content together on your own and also work with partner organizations to help them share their knowledge on Wikipedia. Uh, Doug Hammarskjöld, who's the second Secretary General of the United Nations, said the United Nations was not created in order to bring us to heaven, but in order to save us from hell. I think Wikimedia has a responsibility to provide the information people need to save themselves. And I think we should get to work on this soon. We don't have a lot of time left. Thank you. So, thank you. thank you. This is to a sister organization. We have done some donation in Wonderful. your name. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And thank, thank you very you. much for your speech thank and you. all the amazing work you're doing there as a, the only Wikimedian in the organization. So, it's time for the next speaker. Free knowledge uh, requires free word and also free great journalism. We are happy to introduce a journalist and a media analyst analyzed, uh, that has followed, you know, this European <coughs> work and the US work with the copyright directive, and this has been a big issue here. So, we welcome you, Emanuel Karlsten, welcome. It's here. Great, thank you. So, the world of journalism is uh, not in crisis, but the media houses are. I had an experience last year uh, where I understood three things. Uh, that journalism is always going to be a necessity to a civil society, that it will be paid for by readers, but the purpose must always be very clear. So, I'm a journalist, I'm a columnist, I'm a media analyst, 
and uh, I write on the things that are overlooked or forgotten by uh, traditional media. Most of the times this means stories on social media. It could also mean uh, uh, things uh, when, uh, or times when politicians or politics are doing things to internet. So last year, in May, I stumbled across this uh, piece of uh, legislation in the European Union called the Copyright Directive. It, uh, um, it was weird to me, and I started to research this, and it was a shilling read. It contained especially two articles. Uh, one, uh, Article 11, called, later called the Link Tax, uh, that would, um, or actually suggested, that media houses are losing money. And because of they are losing money, every site, every uh, blog, uh, or every, uh, everyone, pretty much, who, that wants to link to a news story, needs to, to pay. Uh, they need to pay to the, to the media house, uh, pretty much. And uh, even Google search needed to pay if they wanted to show a snippet of text from the news story in the Google search results. So this was, of course, weird, because it was threatening the, the, and taxing the very foundation of internet, the hyperlink. And then there was this other article called Article 13, which was later called the Upload Filter, demanding all social media platforms to filter every content uploaded on their platform in search for copyright infringement. If the text, image, video, or audio would contain any copyrighted content, it should be blocked before even published. So I read this and I understood that no other media houses, no other journalists were reporting on this and it was weird. So I wrote my column on this and um, I summarized it like this. How about a filter that reads what you uploads, writes and publishes and instantly removes it if it's illegal? This topic, hardly, because Sweden has already approved it and EU is about to follow. This blew up online, of course, especially with young readers, uh, because they perhaps more than others understood its implication that this was in fact one of the big decisions of our generation. If every piece of content should be stripped of copyrighted information, it would be difficult to ever upload uh, something. Even if it's just recording something from your room, you would have perhaps music in the background or a poster or painting on the wall, which would be a copyrighted uh, infringement. And that would mean that the video could not be uploaded. Other journalists, even uh, EU correspondents that's full time in the European Parliament covering stories said, well, you're overreacting, this is nothing, this will never be passed, and if it will be passed, it will be a must, much more altered version of it. This is a normal process, pretty much, so don't worry about it. But the internet community, they reacted the opposite way. They put together petitions that gathered hundreds of thousands of signatures to protest against this. Uh, Wikipedia in Poland, Germany and Spain blacked out their sites in protest of the directive. And the members of parliament started receiving so many calls and emails and just reactions that they said they never experienced anything like it on any other single uh, issue or question. Still, media outlets were not reporting on it. And soon, members of parliament started thinking about this. What's, what is this? Could this really be the biggest thing in our term in, in the European Parliament? Is there something else behind this? They started thinking or suggesting or looking for alternate, alternative explanations, thinking perhaps these are just bots. These are not citizens, they are just bots coming to us to kind of manipulate the process. Perhaps Facebook and Google is behind these reactions, and they are not real people. And they started saying this publicly, and they said it privately as well. And I know this because I decided to travel to the parliament myself, out of my own pocket, to, to witness and cover the, this vote uh, on the parliament in Strasbourg in France. And I talked to them, and they said this to me as well. They really believed that they were not really citizens. It was just Facebook that kind of manipulated the legislative process. And I was astonished, surprised. It was shocking, pretty much, because because it was citizens that we were talking about, really. So when the vote on the directive was passed on the parliament, the whole parliament actually decided to stand up because they felt they did something good. They had stood up against whoever was behind all of this. And I was shocked because it was a complete sh a thunderous applause for, to, to themselves for actually standing up on this. Do we have a clip of that? 
Oh, we don't have a clip of that. All right. Anyway, so there was thunderous applause uh, uh, of, of them just standing up. Uh, and and I, it was weird because if it, it was if they had won a victory. Against who? I don't know. So after the vote um, in Parliament, it was only me and one other journalist that actually wanted to talk to the, the leading rapporteur of the directive, Axel Voss. And it was weird because I felt in Sweden that no one was reporting about it, but I just figured that when I came to the parliament, I would see a lot of other reporters being there covering its in-depth story. But it was only me and one other Dutch uh, guy. Uh, oh, here we go with the, the thunderous applause. I had to click again. All right. It was only me and one other Dutch guy trying to interview this guy, uh, this, uh, uh, this rapporteur of the directive. And by me just asking a few questions to him about the directive, about what he has voted on, it became clear that he had no idea of the, the in-depth implications of the directive. And I could do breaking stories that had spread both in my country and in the whole Europe by just being there talking to the politicians. So. The directive had passed, it has not passed completely, they passed into a final trilogue talks and was due to be, have one final vote left before it was uh, supposed to be a law in the, in the countries of the European Union. It was six months later, March 2019, this year. So by now I realized how big support it was. I had a great following, the readers, I had many readers on my story. And I thought, could I go from publishing in traditional media to publish on my own blog, on my own site, and do it free and open for everyone? Could I ask my readers that I felt was more and more depending on my reporting on this story to, to cover my expenses, to, cover, to pay me, really, to travel for the final vote and uh, allow me to, to report on it as open as possible, accessible as possible, under a free and open license, CC BY. So I did that. I decided to create a Kickstarter asking, please help me. I'm going to two days to Strasbourg to cover the final vote. I'm asking for 3,000 euros. Uh, help me fund this trip. And with one hour, it was funded. And I was just astonished, of course. I didn't know what to expect. And I said, OK, I'll, I'll add another day for 1,000 more euros. And it was uh, funded in within minutes. So I thought, okay, so um, double the sum. I'll bring another photographer with me. We'll be two journalists, and we'll also go to a trip to the biggest, um, to the biggest protest demonstration wherever it is in Europe, and we'll cover it, and we'll do video, uh, photography, text, whatever you want, uh, and, and we'll just go. And with that, in a day, it was funded as well. Okay, I'll, I'll add a translator. He'll be on standby the whole time, and he'll translate everything to English. And within another day, or within the time, it was funded as well. And then I really didn't have anything else to, to fund. So I was just happy with that, right? So I traveled. We went to, uh, to Strasbourg. And uh, we had this, with this tremendous support, this little team. And we actually went before that to, to Berlin to cover this big protest. It was the biggest one in Berlin. Hundreds of thousands of people out on the streets protesting against this uh, directive. And, uh, and of course, we also went to Strasbourg to cover the final vote, which was passed by, by five votes, not amended, by five votes. Only five votes uh, among the 700 uh, members of parliament. And I could tell you a lot of stories about that from being there, and a lot of things that are cumbersome or difficult about that. But that's not the main point. That's not the main point uh, why I'm here today. The main point is how this was showcasing to me how journalism will financially survive. That when made clear to readers how their money to support journalism will make a difference, not only for themselves, but for the society, they will have no problem paying for open, accessible journalism. So when I came home, I just said, OK, so this is over, it's passed. But if you want me to keep an eye open, I'll do that as well for how it will be implemented in the European countries the following uh, years. And sure, no problem. They funded that, that as well. So I can just keep an eye open for, for it. And all of this proves to me how bright the future of journalism is. That media houses might collapse, but when something dies, something new will resurrect. So we as a society have a, an important mission to keep good information to the open to the public so they can be informed, make better decisions. 
And I know this is not new to Wikipedia. This is how you're funding your whole, the whole process, I guess. But for journalism, this is groundbreaking. And when The Guardian last week announced that they're finally profitable, it was because they asked readers, please help us fund our journalism to keep it accessible, to keep it open. And they're profitable for the first time in decades. And I believe this is the future. To collectively fund good content to be open and free for the benefit of all. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. And to hand over a token of appreciation, we have uh, Vicky Media Sweden have donated in your name to the UNDP. Wow, great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. So, you can join me if you want to. A little later, I think. Okay, uh, so um, I would like to once again check your knowledge on uh, Wikimedia Sweden. So please pick up your phone, put in menti.com and use the code 317077. Could we have that up on the screen? Fantastic. So our first question is, how many articles are there on the Swedish Wikipedia? Some people still answering. And you are correct, 3.7 million. Woohoo! that's really amazing. And my second question is, which was the most visited Wikipedia page in Sweden this summer? You are totally right. The tragical accident who took place 1986 of Chernobyl, and we think that uh, it's um, probably likely due to the recently launched HBO TV series about Chernobyl. And talking about Chernobyl, yesterday I was speaking with Mark, uh, the next speaker, and he told me that he recently had uh, updated sources about Chernobyl, so it would be easy to find facts and update the web, Wikimedia, Wikipedia and things. And he works towards uh, universal access to knowledge, and the organization have more than 30 years, 20 years plus, uh, experience of web history. Uh, that is really amazing, I think. He's the director of Wayback Machine at the Internet Archive. Give me a big hand for Mark Graham. All right, hi. Um, I'm thrilled to be here. I'm, I'm truly honored uh, and excited because I get to talk about like my favorite subject in the world, which is the Internet Archive. Uh, and I get to do it among friends, uh, folks from the Wikipedia community. Uh, I'm going to basically introduce some of the work of the Internet Archive in the context of the Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs, uh, and also relative to uh, Wikipedia. So the Internet Archive is a 22-year-old uh, nonprofit based in San Francisco uh, th whose mission is universal access to all knowledge. Uh, we've got about 150 staff folks, about 50 of them in San Francisco, and the rest spread around the world. Uh, and uh, we work in the space of taking analog material and digitizing it, uh, taking digital material and preserving it, and making that information available worldwide. We don't charge anything for our services, there's no advertising on our site, and we don't track you. No strings attached, basically. Uh, and I'm going to do an overview of some of our key projects uh, as they relate to the SDGs. Uh, so, goal four, quality education. You know, in some ways it was kind of hard because there's 17 of the SDGs and I thought, well, as a library, 
uh, we're about educating people and fundamentally education uh, underpins uh, the success of every one of, of the SDGs, but in particular with regard to education, one project is that we've been archiving open access uh, journal literature. So we have compiled 18 million papers that are all available, uh, no strings attached, complete open access. They're all backed up to the Wayback Machine, I should say also. And, uh, and uh, the, uh, uh, Brian Newbold, who's here, who's the researcher on this project, met one of the contributors of about a million of these papers last night, a, a fellow uh, Wikipedia. So it's, it's good to be here and collaborate with our friends. We also digitize a lot of books. We digitized about, uh, uh, we digitized several million books and we do about a thousand a day. And this is a, a, a picture of the machine that we use to digitize books. Yes, they're operated by human beings. Human beings turn the pages and press the buttons to cause the cameras to flash and take high quality photographic images of pages, which are then turned into a whole series of derivative uh, works, including through optical character recognition, the text, and then we're able to do full text indexing, et cetera. So 1,000 books a day, we're in the process of ramping that number up. Our, our goal is 2,000 books a, a day. We make these books available in a variety of ways. One of them is something called Open Library, openlibrary.org, and you can go there and you can discover books and you can uh, borrow them if they're, um, if they're a, a modern work. We've also collaborated with about 20 major libraries, uh, Boston Public Library, Georgetown Law, and some, some others on a way to make books more widely available in a digital format through libraries. It's called Controlled Digital Lending. A group of about uh, 20 uh, uh, copyright scholars and, and, and uh, librarian scholars got together and they wrote a 40-page white paper making the case for why a library can take and choose what format it wants to lend a book in. They can choose to lend a book in a, in a paper format and if they own a paper version of a book, they can choose to lend that book in a digital format with two controls. Control one is the number, so it's a one-to-one -one ratio, and the second is the control that the these digital versions that they lend out are, are, uh, use DRM software, uh, encrypted basically uh, with a, a, a Adobe encryption. So uh, controlled digital lending is one of the ways that we make uh, books available. Another project that we're working on is to link up books that we have to Wikipedia articles. So this is the, the Martin Luther King Jr. English uh, Wikipedia page, and down at the bottom, the first citation you see is to a book on page 138. So if you click on that link, you go right to page 138 in that book. In the last two weeks, we've added links to more than 30,000 books um, from uh, English Wiki. There's about another 90,000 books, which I basically just have to press a button and I can add the links to all of those books. And then we've also um, begun to build wish lists for various language Wikipedia sites. Uh, my wish list right now for EN Wiki is about 1.2 million. And through a special relationship we have with a used bookseller called Better World Books, we're going to uh, work toward getting a, a, a great number of those books to acquire hundreds of thousands of those books, digitize them, and then uh, cause links uh, between them and Wikipedia articles. And we're gonna to roll that out with uh, 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 other language Wikipedia editions, and I would welcome, as in every one of these examples today, welcome your participation in helping to make this a reality. For, for several years, we've been working to fix broken links on Wikipedia pages. We're probably within the Wikipedia community most well known for this. We've gone through 26 Wikipedia language editions and we've identified more than 13 million broken links. These are URLs that would have returned a 404. It would have looked something depressingly like this, sorry, page not found. But then we've gone into the Wayback Machine and we found archives of those and then edited the URL in the article to point to the archive. Uh, so we've basically fixed one of the 13 uh, million broken links uh, and we're just getting started. Uh, uh, SDG goal 11, I've got three examples here, I'll go through them fairly quickly, of some collections that we've built 
that basically are helping to preserve some cultural heritage in the world. We have hundreds of thousands of collections. This is just three of them. This one is uh, it's the world's largest collection of Tibetan Buddhist literature. We teamed up with the Buddhist Digital Research Center and, uh, and, and put this, uh, this uh, collection together. Once again, everything that I'm showing you today, you can go to archive.org and you can click and you can, um, you can read full text of. Here's another relatively interesting collection. It's of palm leaves with a Balinese writing on them. And we teamed up with, uh, with scholars in Bali and uh, they, they claim that they think that we've digitized about 90% of all of the literature written in Balinese um, from these, these palm leaves. Uh, and to show you kind of the spectrum of the things that we work in, we have Buddhist literature, we have palm leaves, and we have 78s. So before there was vinyl, there was 78s. These are these like record-like things made out of shellac. And the Boston Public Library donated a large number of them to us. We've so far digitized about 137,000 of them. And, uh, and you can go to the archive, you can listen to them. We've also created some applications for Alexa and Google Home, so you can go, Alexa, ask the Internet Archive to randomly play Jazz 78s. Oh, and by the way, yes, you can also say, hey, Google, ask the Internet Archive to play The Grateful Dead. We have probably the largest collection of Grateful Dead concerts, more than 12,000 of them. For, for many people, that's what we're, we're most known for, is our Grateful Dead collections. Maybe not people here in this room. Um, relative to goal 13, addressing climate um, action, so what you're looking at here is two versions of a web page from a US government website. We worked with the Environmental Data and Governance Initiative, EDGI, and we basically take archives of tens of thousands of US government websites every day dealing with uh, environmental issues, and then we compare them day to day. And they just, they just so this organization, EDGI, just put out a 50-some page report documenting about a 25% reduction in information about climate change on US government websites. They would change words like climate change turned into uh, weather, or they would change the title of the scientists that are working to um, obscure what they're working on. In this case, on the left, you have some, some information about climate change. On the right, you basically are saying access denied. Sorry, that information is no longer available to you. Um, this information is all maintained in the Wayback Machine. You can go back and you can, can find it. You might be asking yourself, where do they store all this stuff? I don't know. They, uh, and basically the answer is, uh, we do it ourselves. Uh, we're pretty cheap. We, uh, we buy uh, hard drives by the pallet, and we, we, uh, we have about 100 petabyte of storage on spinning disk right now. That's about 50 petabyte of unique storage, but we're also pretty paranoid, and so we keep at least two copies of it in different locations and write data simultaneously. And as I said, we're really cheap, and one of the ways we save money is we don't use air conditioning. Uh, we basically use cool San Francisco air and some fans, and it works. It works pretty well, actually. We've been working for a long time now on archiving news. We archive about 200 million news URLs a week. And by the way, that's about 10% uh, of the total number of URLs. We archive about 2 billion URLs into the Wayback Machine every week. That's a few thousand every second. And, uh, and what you're looking at here is a representation of a project that we engaged in recently where we, we asked ourselves the question, what are all the sources of news in the world? So we, we aggregated from a couple dozen existing uh, well-known news sources and came up with the number 176,647. It's, it's uh, obviously a moving target and it has to do with the definition of what is news, et cetera. But this is our, our working set right now and we're um, both archiving from this set of news sources and we're also um, about to upload this to Wikidata because everything that we do, kind of the idea of you don't have to write you know, code that's already been written, I don't want the next uh, person coming along who wants to have a, a good source of sources of news in the world to have to compile on another data set. So, um, so we'll be working on that. And, and here's a, one way that, that news ends up being, uh, information we have in the archive ends up being of value. 
uh, a journalist from CNN, Andrew Kaczynski, uh, uses the Wayback Machine extensively to go back and find information that may lo no longer be available in the public web. And he found information about um, someone that Donald Trump was nominating for a high-level position in the US government and found information about this person's uh, misogynist writings uh, and uh, that was no longer available on the public web, found these uh, on the Wayback Machine, uh, publicized it, and this person uh, is not up for that job any, anymore. Uh, yeah, we yeah, have a little success story. I thought we were going to get the applause from the Fix and Broken Link since it's hard to tell the audience here. But, uh, and, uh, or this one, and this one, like, this is not an applause. This is actually like a real bummer, right? It's like governments change, and sometimes when they do that, they try to erase the history. Uh, and when, when there was a failed coup in Turkey recently, for example, uh, not only is Wikipedia not available from Turkey, but more than 150 news organizations were just taken off the air completely. And, uh, and so researchers got a hold of us and said, hey, these archives that you have of these Turkish uh, news organizations are the only records of these that are available today. And here's uh, one, uh, uh, unfortunately, very recently out of the, the headlines. Uh, I, I said so far that we archive through the Wayback Machine, the web. I talked about books, talked about 78s and music. Uh, and, um, and software and academic papers. I didn't mention television, but we do archive a lot of television. We archive 60 television news channels 24 seven. We've been doing that for more than eight years. So we have a couple million hours of television news. And like many of the things we, we work with, we then try to turn that into data in some fashion. Extract out the data, extract out the metadata so that it can be useful for researchers and journalists and, and activists and others. So here's um, a case in which uh, the New York Times used our, our, our data from our recording of Fox News and other news organizations and went through and found uh, the, the very same words that the murderer in El Paso, Texas was using relative to uh, characterizing uh, immigrants in the United States with messages that were being transmitted um, by the Trump administration and, and on Fox News, et cetera. So basically, if you take media and turn it into data, you can do some more um, interesting uh, and useful research on it. So here's our, our, our big idea, if, if, if you will, is that every book ever written, and there's maybe 100 some million books so far that have been published, um, but that every single one of, of those books and that every academic paper, as I said, we've cataloged about 18 million of them open. We know that about, we have metadata on about 80 other uh, million academic papers. Every web page, including all of the millions and millions of web pages that have existed for, for a variety of reasons may no longer be available on the public web. All of these resources should be a click away. You know, um, you, uh, Chernobyl was mentioned here, and when I saw the Chernobyl HBO special, I immediately went to Wikipedia and was asking Wikipedia questions. And I saw opportunities to help make that better. So I'm kind of obsessive, and so I, I went online and I, I bought 12 books about Chernobyl, uh, and uh, including some Russian ones and others, and, and then I donated them to the Eternal Archive, we digitized them all, and now, they're now all available. And uh, so I'm, I'm looking for partnership. And every single one of the examples I spoke of today, uh, we are open for partnership to be able to take this information and more fully integrate it in with Wikipedia, in with Wikidata, and with other uh, open knowledge projects. So every book, every academic paper, and every web page should be a, just a click a day. So please join us to help make this a reality. And if you're ever in San Francisco to support Goal 17, partnerships to achieve the goals, come visit us. Uh, as you saw in that, that first slide, our building, it's, it's a church. We bought a church, a church of Christian scientists, um, and now it's a temple for knowledge, uh, knowledge and information. So I invite you to please, seriously, to come visit us. And uh, some people here have, have come and have lunch with us. We have a lunch every Friday, and we give a tour, and we'll invite you into our community and figure out a way that we can work together. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. Also to you, we have donated some money. Okay, great. Uh, thank, you. Yeah, great. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very interesting. And I hope, I hope a lot of you go there for the lunch and start a cooperation to fill up more of this space.
Uh, now we will go a, a little into my, one of my uh, subjects that is close to my heart. Is this goal number five, gender equality. We will do that as an introduction to the next speaker. Um, you know all that there is a gap between women and men in society. And um, that also is being mirrored on Wikipedia and Wiki Commons and all this. And Sweden is usually one of the countries that are amongst the ten, uh, top ten countries in the world, if you look at gender equality. We have not been number one. Um, and we haven't also, one part of the gender equality is representation. And we have not, in Sweden yet, have a, a prime minister that is female. So one part of gender equality is this um, representation. Another one is about content. And content, if we look at Wikipedia, for example, I got some information that there is four times more articles about soccer players than about dancers. And dancers, if you see both in history and if you look at dancers in the whole world. So you can see that also this gap is reflected on, uh, on Wikimedia. So we want to show a little film where the Swedish government have tried to change this a little bit about the wiki gaps. So please, the film. We live in a time of unparalleled information wealth. Never before I have so many access to so much knowledge. But it doesn't always represent a true picture of the world. The world's largest encyclopedia. Wikipedia. It's edited almost entirely by men. Men who write about other men. Nine out of ten editors are men. Just 20% of biographies are about women. We can change this together. together. Let's make Wikipedia a place for everyone. <laughs> Written by everyone. Good work. So we are very honored to have with us today the next speaker, the State Secretary of, to the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Annika Söder. Welcome her with a big hand. Hey. Thank you. Dear friends, um, the moderator just said that we have not had a woman prime minister in Sweden. What we do have is a man who is a prime minister and also a feminist. And we have a feminist government and we have a feminist foreign policy. And I'm really proud to be here uh, to uh, meet uh, so many wiki medians uh, that have come here and we're proud uh, to have had the opportunity also to welcome some of you to the foreign ministry yesterday. Uh, and I'm also very happy to have been asked to speak not only about wiki gaps and gender equality, but also about the 2030 agenda, the sustainable uh, development goals. And this is, of course, of key importance, as we all know, because we live in this area of fake news uh, and where factfulness, as Hans Rosling uh, put it, will have to be in the, in the forefront. Uh, the um, Agenda 2030 was decided in 2015 when the turmoil in the world was not as difficult as it is today. Uh, and the agenda is an opportunity for all of you to hold us, the political leaders, accountable to what we committed to do with all the goals uh, before 2031. Uh, we strive to be at the forefront as much as we can, uh, as was said on gender equality, but also when it comes to climate action. 
Uh, and we are, we are sure that we can form part of the leadership that would take us towards sustainable societies. But we cannot do it alone. Leadership is certainly needed and at all levels. And we need to be brave because this has become an uphill battle. Uh, and uh, if civil society uh, and free media will not be allowed not only to exist, but also to uh, make progress and spread, I think we are all uh, in a very, very difficult uh, situation. Uh, so I would like to say a few words about, first about goal 16, about peaceful societies, about freedom of speech and access to information. As I said, important democratic principles are being undermined and challenged. Uh, the space for civil society is certainly shrinking by the day. Uh, independent media are meeting opposition and they are very often harassed. Authoritarian and regressive tendencies and leaders are on the rise. It's happening on every continent and in large and populous countries, meaning that large numbers of people are affected by the trend. And more people today live in countries that cannot be called democracies than people living in democracies. And of course, democracy is much more than holding free and fair elections. It's about the freedom to think, speak. It's about the freedom to love. Democracy means the right to influence, to vote and to demand accountability. Democracy and gender equality are closely linked, of course. Like democracy, gender equality is also being challenged. Uh, but it's true that giving all people, men and women, equal opportunities is actually at the center of true democratic thinking. And it's at the center also if we are to achieve the goals. And if we are to come over uh, and deal with goal 10, a goal that is very close to my heart, namely inequalities and to create equal societies with equal opportunities. Um, the freedom of expression and the right to access to information are preconditions not only for civil and political rights, but also for economic uh, development and social development and closely linked to the Agenda 2030, to the goals. Uh, and goal 16, peace, justice and strong institutions um, are at the center of this goal. Access to information, which is one of the targets of goal 16, is essential for democracy, for the social contract, to fight corruption. Actually, Sweden had a, a, ru a rule and a law on access to information already in 1766, long before a full-fledged democracy was the case uh, in Sweden, and so we have fairly low levels of corruption. To fulfill its role as a cornerstone of democracy, the media must be able to operate in an environment free from fear, journalists, media workers, bloggers, artists, authors, writers must be allowed to discuss and debate everything freely and safely. Journalists and media workers must be able to scrutinize and investigate those in power and express informed opinion without the fear of persecution. We also know that female media workers face double vulnerability and are frequently victims of intimidation, threats and violence and even death. We cannot accept impunity for these crimes, which, in addition to being tragic in themselves, also threaten to weaken our society by curbing uh, freedom of expression and information. The state has a role when it comes to guaranteeing and promoting these rights, not to hamper or diminish them. I also believe that it is you, people who work on this on a daily basis, 
uh, and that come to conferences like the one we have here today uh, that can promote the best ideas to make the situation better. Active civil society participation at all decision-making levels is, of course, a key uh, element in this, because these ideas and opinions need to meet and flourish, and that is vital for making progress in society. To strengthen an open and democratic media landscape and ensure respect for freedom of expression and journalists' safety and security, this is also a clear part of Sweden's work for democracy in the world, which is, ac which is actually now one of three priorities in our uh, foreign policy uh, statement. It's also an agenda for the future. People want to have the chance to influence their own lives and their societies. It's obvious. It's the foundation of democracy that everyone should have that same right. Often we see young people being brave and demand equality, justice and freedom. That is why it's so important that we work with and for young people. There, the goal number four on quality education uh, comes in and it's of key importance to hold governments accountable uh, to provide uh, equal opportunities when it comes to education for both boys and girls. So I'm convinced that free knowledge is the most important way to hold governments accountable and make them see to it that we achieve the sustainable development goals. So on gender equality and goal number five, um, as you may know, Sweden was the first country uh, to pursue a feminist foreign policy. For us, this is about the three R's, rights, representation, and resources. We do this because it's our conviction that gender equality is right, and also because it's a basic condition for peace, no women, no peace, for security and for democracy. It's essential for Agenda 2030, again. How can a country prosper if half of its population is left behind. Without achieving goal five, none of the other 16 goals will be achieved. A new state of affairs that is also very negative when it comes to gender equality needs uh, a clear and strong response. Extra efforts are needed to ensure that everybody is seen and heard. They say that we should give women voice. Women have voice. It's only a matter of listening to those voices. This is true both in the real world and in the digital world. That is why we launched Wikigap. I had the opportunity to be at the launch at the United Nations in New York, where hundreds of volunteers worked on their articles for Wikipedia and the other uh, wikis, and that was really an amazing experience. I know that many of you uh, have been involved in the Wikigaps events that have been organized in cooperation with our embassies around the world and with local partners in almost 60 countries. It has contributed to more than 32,000 new or edited articles about women in more than 30 languages worldwide. And as we speak, these articles have chalked up over 100 million page views, and we're still counting since the launch of the initiative in 2018. That's... <laughs> Thank you. 100 million uh, page views. That's not bad. And 100 million times, uh, and the achievements uh, with this have been made clearly visible through all those views, and I hope that this has inspired many girls and boys throughout the world. It would never have been possible without 
all of the voluntary participants. Let me also stress that the government does not write articles. This is about freedom of expression. We're only the facilitator, the platform, and hopefully we give some inspiration to all those that have worked on Wikigaps. And I can assure you that we will continue with Wikigap next year in 2020. Uh, and I hope that here at this conference uh, in Wikimania it will be possible to discuss how this can be taken forward to more than 60 countries and uh, in many, many uh, locations around the globe. Let me also say that I guess that there are other gaps that we need to fill and I uh, challenge everyone, including other governments, to identify gaps and inspire voluntary writers to continue to make uh, this enormous encyclopedia of the world uh, the best source to go to. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. So we would like to... Uh, hand over this. It's a donation made in your name f uh, from Wikimedia Sweden as a thank you. And it's a donation to the UNDP program. Excellent. Thank you thank so you. much. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Thank you for coming. Big hand. Thank you. So to get an even deeper understanding what is happening throughout the world, not only in the regions and contexts, but also through different diversity, we have invited four Wikimedians to join us today and to share their thoughts and challenges that they are facing today. So the first on stage is the current executive director of Wikimedia Argentina. She has been part of the Wikimedia movement since 2014. She's also part of the Roles and Responsibility Working Group for the Wikimedia Strategy Process. Make her feel welcome. A big applaud for Ana Torres. So maybe you can have a seat there? Yeah, sure. Yeah, so we, so we mix a little bit. Um, our next on stage is the board member from Tavan. She's a program committee member of ESAP 2018 and now a team member of Community Health Working Group. A big hand for Jamie Lynn. Woohoo! Please have a seat. Yes, and then we have the co founder and board member of Open Foundation West Africa. He is also a member of Resource Allocation Working Group for the Movement Strategy, and, and he also 2017's Wikimedian of the Year. Yeah, he's been a member of the Movement for seven years. Welcome, Felix Nordi. And last but not least, he's active in. Uh, active member of the international Wikimedia LGBT plus community in the user group and that also organize community projects around peace and social justice uh, within Wikimedia Austria. He has been active in the moment since 2005. Welcome Thomas Schallhardt. You guys are, are so eager to be here. We didn't even have a chance to say your name before you were up here sitting down and like, woohoo, let's, <laughs> let's roll, right? Yeah, <laughs> it's quite interesting to be here and so happy to talk about how we can link the SDGs to um, Wikimedia. Yeah, we're super, super happy to have all four of you here. So a big welcome. Thank you. So my first question is going to Anna. Good. <laughs> Good. <laughs> what, uh, uh, what is your main focus for the next year within your region with specific regards, of course, to the SDGs? Okay, um, first of all, I want to say that I'm very happy to see that this year Wikimedia theme is about the global goals. I think that working accordingly to these goals can help us build the movement that we all want to see. Uh, uh, when it comes to, to talk about um, what happens in, in Argentina in particular and also in Latin America, it's difficult for someone like me that lives in Latin America to choose the most relevant goal among all of these uh, because none of them has been achieved so far and so a lot of them are very far to be achieved even in 
by 2030. But when it comes to describe what we do in Argentina in, in the region, I think that there are two of them that are a lot, I mean, they describe very well what we are doing today. The first one is um, the global goal number 10. It's about reducing inequalities. I think that you're talking about inequalities, talking about a problem that happens all around the world. Um, but uh, even this goal is very focused on an economic and social way. Reducing inequality is what drives our programs and our mission in Argentina. And we do it in four main perspectives. The first one is reducing inequality in access to knowledge. To do this, we develop projects uh, to create content with, very, with three main characteristics, a very specific characteristics. The first one has to be content that is locally relevant. This is super important for us. The second one is content that is created from the global south. And the third one is in our own language. And to reach as much as the society as possible, we partner with Strategic Alice, uh, as also the global goal number 17, I think. It's about partnerships. Uh, um, in order, I mean, despite the challenges that we have in order to reach more people. And when it comes to challenges and explaining about what challenges are we facing, um, just in numbers of the United Nations, 600 million young people today are still lacking the minimum level of literacy. Uh, that means there's people who cannot read, cannot write. Um, I'm wondering how we can make this global, um, this Wikimedia movement, the Wikimedia movement more accessible for everybody, really for everybody around the world. Uh, the other part about reducing inequality is about um, uh, inequality regarding who writes the, the, the knowledge. I mean, it's fair that we uh, in Latin America, the ones that we have well-established communities are the ones writing the knowledge for the rest of Latin America. I don't know how can we make sure that those people who are not in the movement yet feel that they have voice and what they have to say is important for all the world. So how can we accompany them is something that we always question. I mean, it's a question that uh, we, I wanted to bring into this discussion. On the other hand, we, we are currently reducing existing, um, uh, the existing inequalities in access to quality education. We do it, of course, by promoting capa capabilities and uh, skills for teachers and students, not just um, regarding um, uh, we do it by uh, uh, doing projects in the schools and, and, uh, and not only online content by creating online content, but also offline, uh, inform I mean, on offline projects. And of course, when talking about inequalities, uh, it's, uh, it's doing it in this movement about gender equality. I think that this movement is so um, doing a lot of things about to address this issue that is a very important one. We want to continue to break the limit the, the barriers that limit the participation of women, but not just women, also those people have been historically excluded of this movement. Um, because we need a diverse movement, and we need that the decision making of this movement needs to have an inclusive and diverse uh, standards. Um, just to close, I want to, 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 to also um, talk about uh, very small, in a very small way, to talk about another go global goal that is super significant for us, which is number 16, is peace, justice, and strong institutions. For us, uh, the Wikimedia projects are not just a source of information. Uh, the Wikimedia projects are a, are a civic tool for education and to build global citizenship. Wikimedia Argentina has a huge program on human rights. Uh, this cross cuts all over, uh, all, everything that we do in our organization is for, because of three main reasons. First, for us, free knowledge is of human right. Um, second, we cannot reduce uh, inequalities if we don't know our rights. And third, of course, the Argentina society, the essence of the Argentina society is built on human rights. Um, so I, I just want to, to, to close this presentation, I mean, little presentation I've, de I've done uh, saying that um, advocating for free knowledge, advocating for freedom of speech, and making, trying to make um, this um, movement uh, uh, more equal. It's uh, something that we are committed to, and I think that is, uh, is, 
is needed to build more democratic society and it's an opportunity that we as in Argentina don't want to miss and I think that the movement shouldn't miss it too, either. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So, Felix, I've been noticing that you are nodding quite a lot when, when Anna was talking. Uh, coming from West, West Africa, are these uh, similar challenges to the ones that you are facing? Yeah, honestly, the SDGs are at not, they are not at a limit where we can say we've attained everything from my continent. Our president is currently an ambassador for the SDG on the continent, and he's doing quite an amazing work um, when it comes to the SDGs. However, we're nowhere near achieving any of the SDG goals. Um, but I wanted to talk more about the um, problems in West Africa in relation to what we do on Wikipedia. And so some of these problems, well, I would say the basic thing that we need to do as Wikimedians is first of all to create awareness. Because none of the things that we're doing here is far away from awareness. The, we're talking about the SDGs today because it's critical for us to show people what is there so that they can be able to play a role in achieving the SDG goals. Now, Wikimedia provides that unique platform already. We provide the base to provide all the knowledge. Yeah. But how are we telling the people that need to access this knowledge? And that's a big problem. We have the notion that Wikipedia can be a source of reference to people and people can learn about Wikipedia through referrals. But not everybody. Imagine the little guy in my village who wants to know about Wikipedia would never know because in his mind, the only thing he can do is to search Google, right? But if we deliberately go out there and run campaigns that, are, can, that can actually onboard people who are interested in knowledge seeking, then that is the way we, we are able to change all these things. So for me, it's very critical, first of all, to talk about awareness because we are assuming that the fact that Wikipedia exists, everybody knows about Wikipedia and not just everybody can know that Wikipedia actually exists and they can use. And so it's fundamental to create awareness about Wikipedia, which in turn affects the SDGs, because the SDGs can only work when people know about them. Now, the other thing I want to talk about is knowledge forms. It, 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 it's as if this movement, we have not recognized that knowledge are in different forms. At the moment, academia only allows us to accept knowledge in written forms. Does that mean that we are trying to save the sum of some human knowledge and not the sum of all human knowledge as we strive to achieve? This is a question that we need to think about because I think the purpose of Wikimedia is to capture the world's knowledge, the whole world, not just some people's knowledge. But at the moment, what it seems that we're doing is capturing the sum of some people's knowledge. We want to attain the, we want to reach a stage where we can say that my knowledge exists on Wikipedia, and every sort of knowledge that exists in the world exists on Wikipedia. That is the time that we will truly achieve the quality of education that exists in the SDG4. As said by Seneca, um, we learn for life, not for school. As he said in Latin, non scholai um, said um, um, vitae decimus. We don't learn because we're learning to attain a job, but we learn because learning is dynamic and it improves our lives each time that we come against um, a new opportunity. And that is very critical for human living, right? So if we can't capture that story of the hero from my country, for somebody to learn about my culture, then there's still some part of the puzzle that is still missing. Yeah. And this is what we're striving, we're, we're striving to achieve. Big hand. Big hand. Thank you, Felix. Very interesting. Thomas, are you seeing some kind of the same? You were active in the LGBT uh, community. Mm -hmm. And how can you see that? Are there the same challenges for you? Or what kind of challenging do you see? Um, well, I will also mostly refer to goal four, quality of education. Um, LGBTI people, unfortunately, are not directly mentioned in the SDGs. They were lobbied out, unfortunately. Um, but um, they are kind of hidden in the SDGs in a few places. And one of them is goal four, that is about inclusive education. And there would also, again, like Felix just said, uh, relate to that. So when we talk about creating the sum of all knowledge, we should also include queer knowledge, and we should include queer people in our movement. 
Um, we have massive uh, misrepresentations in, in our movement at, at the moment. The Global South is less represented than the Global North. Uh, women are less represented than men, and minorities uh, uh, have always the challenge to, to be represented, and queer people are one of them. And it gets even more apparent when we go intersectional and we talk about queer women or queer people of color or queer people from the global south. Um, and that these people are not represented is not because they don't want to be represented, it's because there are structures that hinder them, and we need to tackle these structures. And if we talk about LGBTI issues, this, these structures are of course, homo and transphobia within our community, but also in society in general that we need to work with and tackle. Um, but also stuff like, um, like that queer knowledge very often happens in the underground. Uh, queer history has always been a history of hiding and of, of kind of creating safe spaces within, within the community. And this kind of knowledge we need, we need to actively seek out. It will not just come to us. Um, it's not mainstream knowledge. Um, so we need to create projects and initiatives that tackle this. We need to involve more LGBTI people in our movement. We need a queer week gap. We, we need projects like queer people in red. We need uh, more things like that. Um, our Wikimedia LGBT plus user group um, tackles a lot of that. We are growing a lot in, at the moment. We're trying to involve more queer people into our movement by organizing community projects for queer people, we're trying to get queer people who are already in our movement to write about queer content. Um, so there are different things that we can do and in the end maybe we will achieve um, a more inclusive way of, of looking at, uh, at the work that we do. For example, when we have, uh, have uh, topics on sexual health that also relates to goal three, that we should have good health and well-being. LGBTI people are especially vulnerable to, um, to not getting the health care that they, that they, that they uh, would need because there's a lack of information, there's a lack, lack of access uh, in a lot of places. And if Wikipedia has a queer perspective on sexual health in articles, that would already change a lot. So there's a lot to do. Thank you. It's great to hear that it's growing, the movement anyway, even though there are still many gaps. <laughs> yeah. Jamie, Hi. Uh, you're coming from Taiwan. Yeah. What is the biggest challenge in your region? Well, I would say if it's come to uh, Chinese Wikipedia, because uh, Chinese P Wikipedia is a group of um, people come from different region and different country, like uh, Taiwanese editors, Chinese editors, uh, Hong, Kong, uh, Hong Kong news editors, and editors in Singapore or all over the world. They edit together. And I think the difficulties that uh, we face on Chinese Wikipedia is related to maybe the mixture with SD Druze 3, 5, 10, and 16. Because um, I will just say it's a community health issue. Like, different people have different point of view. And in Chinese Wikipedia, the gender ratio is mm, 9 to 1. So 9 male Wikipedians, 1 female Wikipedian. And most of female Wikipedians suffer from sexual harassment, sometimes bully. Because they just say, oh, you are girls. We don't think you can do this. But the, but the female Wikipedians, they do contribute a lot. So this kind of, uh, how to say it? it mm, poor behavior? Well, just affect the community health in, our, uh, in Chinese Wikipedia. And also, because you know, we come from different regions, we have a different point of view, and not all the uh, regions, they can upload their uh, information and can be shown, can be seen in the like, international platform. So when we have debate, especially for some um, articles, it's very hard to have very equal communication between each other. Yeah, and so for if it comes to our region, I because I'm a committee member of the EZF, the East Asia, East South Asia, and Pan Pacific area. In our area, the chapters or the user group are different community. We have different, um, how to say, different maturity. Yeah, so sometimes our language are very different. Not everyone is good at communicating in English, or for them, they don't know, they even don't know that foundation exists. It's very hard for us to cooperate with each other, so this is related to the uh, SDG 17. 
But we do need to just cooperate with each other and help each other to make our own region become better and better and share the experience with each other. But I do face a difficulty to communicate with different community, especially, okay, English is not our mouth tongue. And also, uh, the education we accept and all the experience we have, totally different. Yeah, so, yeah, but we still work on it. But so for Wikimedia in Taiwan, I think it's a very warm place. Of course, we need to improve the um, gender equity in our society. But overall, I will say, OK, we need to improve the community health part and also the uh, partnership part. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you all four of you for providing us with greater insights about your challenges. And I would recommend all of you, if you're interested in getting involved or helping Felix, Anna, Jamie or Thomas in their work, please uh, you know, get in touch with them, either here at the event or afterwards. Sorry, guys, I haven't checked this one with, uh, with you, but yeah. I, I assume it's okay. Happy to help always. So yeah. uh, feel free to contact them afterwards. Thank you. Thank you. And also, we want to show Wikimedia oh, Sweden. We want to show appreciation to you and also donated some money to the U uh, UNDP. Thank you, yeah. so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Can I have the one? Yeah, oh, of course. <laughs> 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 Thank you. <laughs> you only do two in Taiwan? What? You only do two in Taiwan? Well, I learned in France. Where are you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I get confused sometimes. Sometimes it's three, sometimes it's four, and then it turns up to five or six. Or so, yeah, I, I don't always know. Yeah. Um, Sometimes it's hugging. Yeah. In Sweden, we do a lot of hugging. Yeah. So before handing over to our last speaker, me and Jenny would thank you all for this amazing afternoon. Thank you to all the speakers for all the amazing knowledge that we've been provided with. And also thank you to the audience that you're both here and also the broadcasting that you are looking uh, on the internet. Um, and we can say also, don't you think, Jenny, this is an overwhelming mov movement. Yeah. There is so much knowledge, so much experience, so much sharing. Uh, with so many smart people contributing to change. And change is very important today uh, in the world. So much, and change with this free knowledge. I think that's a good way of changing. So thank you for your hard work. And thank you to the speakers. So we give them a big hand before we're handing over. Good batch. Good batch. So, uh, with that said, our last and final speaker for today is, of course, the Executive Director of the Wikimedia Foundation, looking fabulous, the one and only Catherine Mayer! Woo! Give her a big hand! Woo Thanks! Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Refer to these conferences and events where we get together with the global community as my favorite time of the year. Uh, it's a little bit like going on holiday, um, except in going on holiday with your family, I go on holiday with 900 of my favorite Wikimedians, half of whom I've never met before. So for me, when I look around, I see old friends and I see new faces. The ability to walk from this venue to the other rooms of the conference is actually, it sort of takes me longer than I expect because of the fact that I'm stopping and saying hello to people and asking them about the projects that they're working on. And I think that's why they call it the hallway track, is because some of the best conversations that you have are often the ones in the middle of the actual sessions you meant to attend. Um, I hope as you look around today in the room and as you've been walking about across the venue, you're having that same experience and hopefully meeting new folks as you go. If it is your first year, I just want to say welcome. Does that, are there any first year folks here in the room? Can I get a big round of applause for the first year folks? 
Welcome to your very first Rickamania. Thank you for joining us, taking a step into this movement, and I hope that we see you for many, many more Wikimanias to come. And if you are, in fact, here for your 15th year, I just want to say thank you. Jimmy's not listening. Thank you for being here for your 15th year, for everything that you've given and done for the community. As you heard earlier today, we are here from 80 countries, of roughly 900 people. And in my mind, this isn't just a conference, it's actually a celebration as well. It's a celebration of community and free knowledge and a celebration of everything that you as Wikimedians have given to the world. It's a moment to look around and appreciate one another for this tremendous gift, which is free knowledge. But it's also a little bit of a call to action because I think every single year that goes by, I view our mission as being more urgent, more clearly defined and more essential, especially in a world in which people aren't sure what information that they can trust or in which so many people and perspectives don't see themselves reflected in conversation about our greatest global challenges. And I think it's a more essential mission because it is also a more inspirational mission as we see so many challenges that seem almost intractable as though we don't know how to surmount them. But when we look at Wikimedia, we see a group of people with so very little in common from so many different languages, cultures, communities, countries, but who have one tremendous thing in common, which is a sense of generosity and faith in one another that when we come together, we can actually build something that changes the world. So I think that this year's Wikimania is actually an opportunity to intentionally seek out and invite more people into our movement, a chance to meet curious, like-minded folks, people who care deeply in, about building and preserving and collecting and elevating free knowledge for the world. We've heard a lot in the course of the day about the SDGs, of course, um, and I spent a little bit of time thinking about this before coming in to the conference about what the meaning of the SDGs is for Wikimania. The, but before I get into that, today the Wikimedia Foundation formally signed and launched a partnership with the UN's Office for the High Commissioner of Human Rights. This is something that recognizes, elevates, and extends some incredible work that's been being done by our colleagues at Wikimedia Argentina. I don't know if anyone from Wikimedia Argentina is in the room. There you are, okay, great. Um, so Wiki Derechos Humanos is a project that the Wikimedia Argentina launched a few years back, which means Wiki Human Rights in Spanish. And it's been adopted very widely across, our, uh, across Latin America, across the region. At the core, I think that human rights is something that is fundamental to the way that we think about what Wikimedia actually does. We talk about freedom of expression, we talk about the right to access information, we talk about the importance of privacy. And at the core of the SDGs, you see human rights underpinning a lot of the functions, the core components of it, the right to shelter, the right to clean food and water, the right to education. I think we believe, of course, that knowledge is a fundamental right and that there are all these other enabling rights that make free knowledge possible. As I mentioned, those rights that safeguard our ability to think, to be curious, to seek information, and then to be able to receive it without any barriers or blocks. <laughs> And in the past, when I used to think about what Wikimedia's role was in the SDGs, their Sustainable Development Goals, I automatically would point to SDG 4, which is the, the goal around education um, and quality education. And in the SDG 4, there's a bit, there is a bit about lifelong learning, which to me felt like where Wikimedia sort of most clearly belonged, a little bit perhaps in gender equality, perhaps a little bit as well in partnerships. But coming into this Wikimania focused on the Sustainable Development Goals, I started to really rethink how I view what our role is vis-a-vis -vis the Sustainable Development Goals. I realized that, in fact, we are in all of them because they are actually in all of us, if that makes any sense. So what I mean by that is that when we think about the life, on, life underwater, for example, and when we think about learning, which is goal 14, um, and we think about all of the tremendous articles that we have about our natural world, or when we think about goal 16, which is about peace and justice, and we think about all the incredible articles about systems of governance around the planet, 
Or if we think about goal seven, which is about renewable energy, and the articles that we have on physics and mathematics that help underpin renewable energy, or essential health information, which is goal th three, and you think about the incredible work that the, uh, oh wait, it's not Wiki Project Med anymore, it's actually an affiliate group now. Does anyone know the name of the new affiliate group? No. Wikimedicine, the incredible work that the Wikimedicine community does in making sure that articles about health are high quality and accessible to all. What I realize is that Wikimedia isn't in a, one of the goals. Wikimedia is actually an essential part of all of the goals, and we have a role to play in supporting and elevating this priority of sustainability. So my question is sort of how do we start? You know, as individuals, what can we do to take on such ambitious challenges? And do we really think that we can fulfill all of these over the course of the next 11 years before 2030? And then I remember that this is actually a community and a room full of idealists who have made their enti this entire community and pro projects possible by coming together and tackling these enormous challenges, often bit by bit, one edit at a time. So, I think part of that is because we're not merely individuals. We're all here as part of what is actually a social movement as Wikimedians, a social movement that's characterized by a desire to see change in the world. It's the thing, as I said, that brings us together despite all of these sort of superficial differences that we might have. And whether you founded a wiki project or spent the last two days at a hackathon building a new tool, or this is your first Wikimania ever, as we already found out there are people in the room, that is the thing that pulls us all together around this common vision and ideal. And that's the thing that should regenerate our energy and joy for our project as we look at, around at each other and think about what is actually possible. Because Wikimedians are not strangers to this concept that ordinary people can change the world for the better. Because we see it every day in the work that we do with every edit to every article, every edit-a-thon that you run, every new editor that you bring into the projects. The act of finding and digitizing information is fundamentally a truly hopeful one. You can keep going. <laughs> Because uh, each of these actions actually creates these ripple effects outside of our communities, outside of the immediate movement. It makes it so much more than a collection of websites and words, but the volunteers, contributors, affiliates, we're all committed to this future that's actually an incredibly aspirational and hopeful future. And as a future in which knowledge allows us to live the lives that we want to live, to live in the societies that we want to live in, and to build the communities and, and future that we aspire to. The community is doing things that, has never, that have never been done before in service of knowledge for the world, which in many ways is actually a radical rejoinder to the way that the world has always been. We talk about, in the movement strategic direction, breaking down the structures of power and privilege that have prevented people from participating in free knowledge. And that's exactly what you're doing every single day. You're questioning these assumptions of what is known and how that knowledge has been created. The work that you're doing is meeting the insatiable curiosity that makes us all human. I think that's an incredibly aspirational and, and joy-filled thing to do. It actually changes lives. So I talked a little bit earlier, I mentioned that Wikimedia Argentina has been doing this work and we've had this partnership with the um, this new partnership with the UN and this office of the Human Rights Commissioner. And I want to speak a little bit more to that because when I talk about changing lives, I, I really mean that in a very fundamental way. Wikimedia Argentina has established themselves as a leader in, in this area of protecting human rights in the free knowledge world. Um, their program, which was originally known as Wikilesa, was an effort to understand the period within Argentina's recent history of being governed by a military junta that was known for widespread human rights abuses. The Wikimedia Argentina community worked with local memory, uh, institutions of memory to be able to document this and make this information more publicly available on Spanish Wikipedia. And in a region in which many countries have actually suffered from similar periods, painful periods in their histories, the model caught on relatively quickly and you saw other Wikimedia communities like Wikimedia Uruguay, Wikimedia Chile, taking this up and exploring their own paths and their own history through Wikipedia, again, as, human, as focusing on human rights, but focusing on it in a very wiki way, focusing on references to citations, verifiability, and building knowledge in a really neutral way that allows for people to explore their past and the past of the countries around them. 
I think that's an incredibly powerful thing, and we've actually seen it, uh, this model continue and be adopted, and already it's beginning to be remixed a little bit, as countries like Mexico and Colombia and Venezuela have also picked this up. Countries with different histories, but also exploring these human rights challenges. So the Office of the High Commissioner on Human Rights take note of this incredible work that is being done because they recognize the power of Wikimedia as a platform to help make people aware of the fundamental tenets of human rights. In fact, the representative from the High Commissioner's Office said today that one of the biggest challenges to human rights today is that if you don't know what your rights are, it makes it very difficult for you to claim them. And so what they are excited to do with Wikimedia and can excited to partner with our community is to think about how we are able to extend information in additional languages, in contexts that people are, are seeking this information so that it is more accessible to more people and they have an understanding of the fundamental rights which we all hold. They're also excited, and I didn't learn this until just very recently, to make their own resources more publicly accessible. I found out just in preparation for the conference that the Universal Declaration on Human Rights, which is the sort of founding text that defines the way that many international human rights treaties have been interpreted and ratified over time, up until recently, I believe up until recently, is actually under copyright. So you have something that actually belongs to all of humanity, and yet, unfortunately, is locked away. It's the power of Wikimedians who are able to have conversations with institutions of knowledge and make them, and make them aware of what these limitation, limiting factors actually are in the pursuit of their own mission and in the pursuit of ours. And as a build up to this, or as a, as a sort of follow on to this, I'm also excited to and let everyone know that Wikimedia Argentina is going to be hosting the very first affiliate organized conference on human rights later this year. So when we talk about changing lives, we are talking about some very fundamental and transformational ways that we change lives, including the way that we understand the rights under which all of us are, all of us can live. So the next one, program that I just want to talk about quickly is, is one that I think is really kind of, it's very cool. So it's the Equal Edit program that Wikimedia Sweden, since we are here in Sweden and hosted by our colleagues at Wikimedia Sweden, have undertaken. Uh, the Equal Edit initiative um, just is, well, hang on one second. So I don't know, does any, is anyone here aware that Sweden has made feminism part of its official foreign policy? Now you know. So uh, in 2014, the Swedish government des uh, decided that feminism would be an official plank of its foreign policy, which I think is really cool, right? It is actually embedding equity into the way that Sweden shows up in the world and the values that it advances. And so it's totally appropriate um, that Wikimedia Sweden would be doing work around equal edit. In fact, I think, and I'm, if I'm not mistaken, Sweden, Wikimedia Sweden was actually a little bit ahead of the Swedish government in placing an emphasis on gender equity in terms of its own work and programs. So, as usual, you know, Wikimedia is out there paving the way and everybody else, including the government, follow me. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so the Equal Edit initiative that Wikimedia Sweden has been involved in, just recently there was an edit-a-thon that they did with a, um, a magazine here. I'm going to say, I hope I'm going to say this right. Historiskan? His Historiskan? Okay, close enough. Thank you. <laughs> uh, what I thought took the whole model of editing for gender equity just another step further. So everyone here is familiar with how we, a lot of edit-a-thons that are focused on gender equity focus on writing articles, biographies of living people about notable women who've been left out of history or notable non-binary people who've been left out of history. What this edit-a-thon did was it actually looked for notable women who already had biographies in Wikipedia, but instead of adding to those, or in addition to adding to those biographies, they actually went back and looked at the articles about the history of Sweden itself, and then rewrote those articles, including the history of women and women's contributions into the history of Sweden. So it takes the activity of editing gender equity into Wikipedia one step further, not just creating biographies of women that are separate from the rest of history, but integrating them in such a way, literally rewriting history to make it more equitable, but also, of course, more accurate as well, which is a part of the whole aspiration of what we do every single day. I love learning about models like this as we continue to remix the great ideas that our community have and they continue to evolve over time and I look forward to seeing similar initiatives inspired by the, by the Equal Edit Initiative. Of course, 
and that is goal five for those who are keeping track, which is around gender equality. So these are just a few of the examples of some of the incredible work that this community does. And I think the common thread between all of these examples is that they take many people and institutions and collaboration to achieve. All right. Oops. <laughs> In the interest of time, I'm gonna skip through a little bit. Uh, so this year's Wikimania, as I mentioned, is a place to bring in new partners, it's a place to bring in new voices, and it's a place to think about what our future in terms of sustainability looks like. And just because I promised I would get up and recap, and that's why my slides were late, uh, what happened today? I mean, we heard from some really inspirational speakers on the stage, listening to different ways in which the SDGs are related to our work. So Professor Sombi was talking a little bit about indigenous languages, and in fact, the role in, in indigenous language in preserving culture and specifically here in Sweden and in the Nordic countries in general, the role and the importance of um, the indigenous language of the Sami people uh, who, who and, and what the documentation of their work and their culture and their lives um, does in order to, sorry, what's that? Um, sorry, and, and what the, the acknowledgement and integration and focus on this can mean in terms of uh, excuse me, preserving really important parts of indigenous cultures here. Secretary Anika Soder highlighted the, the Swedish government has come together, as I said, mentioned, talking about gender equality, but very specifically through the Wikigap project, which has been something that has taken place now in 60 different countries, or nearly 60 different countries around the world, which is again an effort to edit Wikipedia around gender equity and inequality. So that takes that biography of living people process of editing for women who've been left out of history, but it's been supported as part of that feminist foreign policy by the Swedish government in partnership in, in embassies and other centers around the world. Um, Tyler Radford's talk from OpenStreetMaps focused on the role and importance of open geo data in, uh, in crisis environments and in the open mapping community as a whole and how that plays into questions of equity, of access to resources and response in terms of crisis. And explained, I think, a little bit to us about why it's really important to have this dynamic knowledge that's available in ways that and, and types of knowledge that are not just about necessarily article spaces, but also knowledge that can be used um, in that geospatial context. So if I, we think the SDGs are a guidepost for our community, um, which I really do, do believe that they are, and that Wikimedia is a leader in the open movement, I think that shows to us what we can do together. If we can go a little further, Greg, sorry. <laughs> um, what we can do together in terms of imp improving and advancing sustainability in the world. But I actually want to ask ourselves, as we are here over the course of this weekend, one of the things that I've learned at every Wikimania that I've been to is that the themes at individual Wikimanias tend to resonate in our community for many years to come. So conversations at Wikimania last year were all about bridging knowledge gaps. and. Today, as we were talking about before I actually started my talk more broadly, knowledge gaps are often conversations around diversity and inclusion and who is involved in the movement and who is creating knowledge. Uh, as you heard, we, know, we had a diversity conference in Stockholm a few years back, and I don't know when the next diversity conference is, but I think that's a good thing because it actually means that diversity has been something that is very much interwoven into so much of the work the community is doing today. So that's a theme from a Wikimania that has continued to resonate across our community and inform our work. So if sustainability is the theme of this year's conference, one of the questions I'm interested in is what kind of future are we building knowledge for and what kind of role can we play in the Wikimedia movement in terms of our own sustainability? The reason I ask that is I don't know the answer to that. You know, the Wikimedia Foundation in 2017, the Board of Trustees voted to uh, approve a resolution calling on the Wikimedia Foundation and the Wikimedia movement to really consider its environmental impact and understand the footprint that we leave in the world from a from, in terms of carbon and, and other carbon emissions and, and other challenges to sustainability. This year, the Wikimedia Foundation completed a report um, on our overall movement's impact and found that we actually produce about 2.1 kilotons of carbon dioxide emissions every single year. That's, I don't know how actually quite to visualize that. I did try to look that up to try to find slides on how do you visualize a kiloton of carbon. It, it's a lot. Um, 
I mean, it's not a lot compared, I think, to the impact that we have in the world, but nonetheless, if we're talking about a sustainable future, you know, this is a really important part of thinking about the sustainability of our projects for the sustainability of our world. Uh, so members of the Wikimedia Foundation are gonna present more about the impact of this report on Sunday, and I encourage you to attend that talk if that's something that's interesting to you. But I wanna ask the question to people in the room to think about as you go into the day and into conversations and into the year to come, is what can we as a movement do to address questions of climate sustainability? What can we as a movement do to think about our own footprint and our own impact and how we can, how we can elevate this critical issue for our planet as a whole? After all, we want our movement to endure well into the future and in order to endure, we really want it to endure in the kind of world that we want to live in. So, oh, we're gonna go forward a little bit, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, I think so. Okay, keep going. <laughs> yep, sorry, I'm so sorry. <laughs> yep, <laughs> keep going. <laughs> oh, wait, wait. A little bit more. <laughs> All right, so, I'm gonna encourage you to attend a few talks that I'm really excited about. Um, the first of which is, go, go up a little bit, sorry, I just wanna get the sessions right. Nope, other direction, okay. The first of which is the difficulties of Wikipedias in languages that are not taught in school. So there is an amazing statistic, or one that really in, sort of struck me when I first learned it, that if you were in an education an education system and you are trying to learn in a language that is not your native language, it's not the one that's spoken at home, you actually only absorb about 50% of the information that's taught to you. So in learning in general, we know that we only absorb a, a percentage of in any information that I'm presenting to you or that an educator or a teacher is presenting. Now imagine that being twice as hard if you're learning in a secondary language. So. Um, on Saturday morning, there's going to be a session talking about what does it mean to actually think about providing knowledge in Wikipedias in which languages are not actually taught in school. I think it's gonna be really interesting. I wanna encourage everyone to go. Uh, later in the af that same afternoon, there's a session, so tomorrow, a session on encouraging the spirit of new editors. Uh, this, I think, is something as we've been talking as a global movement about increased diversity and growing our movement in places that it doesn't exist today. What does it feel like to be an editor for the first time? What would it mean to view this movement through fresh eyes. Many people in the room here today have been editors for a very long time, contributors to our community, and you've seen this movement change and grow, but you may remember what it felt like when you first started. I'd ask the question, what does it look like now to enter into a movement like this, and how do we make sure it's as welcoming as possible for new folks? And then, of course, this wouldn't be a talk for me if I didn't mention movement strategy. The movement strategy team is running tracks all throughout the conference that are looking at recommendations for the future of our movement, for movement structures and governance, questions around diversity and community health. Uh, I encourage you to attend all of those. And also, there's evening at 9 p.m., if you're still awake, if you're a night owl, we'll be hosting a conversation at the Clarion Hotel uh, with a member of the Wikimedia Board of Trustees, Lisa Lewin, talking a little bit about what can we learn from the future, what can we see into our future when it comes to movement strategy. I hope that you'll be able to attend. And I promise I won't have slides. It'll be a really informal conversation. I think it'll make it a lot easier. So that's it. I think what I want to close on just saying is that if you look around this room, um, you know, we are talking about the SDGs. They're incredibly large, audacious challenges for our world. And I think if you look at all of them as a collective, it's hard to necessarily know where to start. And I think, tend to think that Wikimedians think of themselves as very practical people, people, people who are doers, people who are focused on what is it that I can contribute at this moment in time in order to make um, you know, Wikipedia better? What can I do to edit this article? What can I do to improve the citation? How do I make this a stronger argument, et cetera, et cetera. These tend to be very, sort of, these are very, um, discrete, tangible activities that we take. But I think that that spirit of tinkering actually hides a tremendous idealism because people who are tinkerers, people who are always looking to improve around the edges are actually people who are tremendous optimists. They're people who believe that things can iteratively get better over time. And it's not just about that one great big idea. It's about taking the systems and the world in which we live in today and trying to actually make them better in really practical ways 
So as we're looking at the SDGs, which as I said, I believe Wikimedia is in all of them and they in fact are literally in all of the work that we do, in all of the edits and articles that we write, what does it mean to take them on in a tinkerer's way? What does it mean to take them on in a Wikipedian's way? Collaboratively improving them bit by bit, knowing that they're always subject to revision, knowing that we can continue to add and be additive, that we can bring new partners in, um, that each of those incremental changes made by so many people, perhaps millions, perhaps billions of people over time, can actually build the world that we want to be in. You know, I don't think it's any surprise or any secret I'll close on, not, not a secret, sorry, it's definitely not a secret. I don't think it's a coincidence, is what I meant to say, that the SDGs aspire to 2030 and that the Wikimedia Movement strategy has also chosen 2030 as a goal. When you try to think 10 years out into the future, it asks you to think far beyond the circumstances of the day to day. It gives you freedom and space to imagine a world that looks different from the one that we're in, but it's still close enough to, that it has the same contours and it seems familiar. That's what we asked the Wikimedia movement and communities to do, looking at our future for 2030, a more diverse Wikimedia community, a more global Wikimedia community, a world in which more people have access to, free, access to knowledge. And the SDGs are asking us to do the same thing. Look that little bit out into the future, 10 years away, close enough that it feels familiar, far enough that it feels like we have time to affect meaningful change. As we think about that world that we want to build, that tinkerer spirit, I hope that you'll bring that to the challenges that we have in front of us, literally in front of us, um, as, and, and think about how we can take them on in the work to come. So again, I'm so sorry about the sort of awkward nature of the presentation, but I appreciate you bearing with me for it. Um, and thanks all for coming, and I hope you have a wonderful Wikimania. Now it's party time, right? Yeah. It's, it's going to be a party. I'm not promising too much, am I? No. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, so... Um, there are buses. There are buses. Waiting for you at 5.30. Uh, I'm not totally exactly... I know Eric informed you in the, in the morning. Uh, but you should find the buses rather fast because they are waiting for you in the city hall. And you will go in that hall where the Nobel Prize party is, so there is where you're going to spend your evening. <laughs>